Good afternoon, delegates. Welcome back to our general debate on the theme, Parliamentary Democ Diplomacy, Building Bridges for Peace and Understanding. We will begin our debate with Lao People's Democratic Republic. You may take the floor. I want to remind all of our speakers that we have a five-minute timeline. We have to stick within our timeline for speeches. Lau? ประธานกองประชุมที่นับถือประธานเพื่อนมิตรสมาชิกรัฐสภาท่านหญิงท่านสายที่แพงทั้งหลาย <laughs> ในนามคณะผู้แทนสภาแห่งชาติลาวครับเจ้าหุ้นศึกเป็นเกียรติเป็นอย่างยิ่งที่ได้เข้าร่วมกองประชุมสมัครสาธารณรัฐสภาสาก
El papel de la diplomacia parlamentaria se vuelve cada vez más crucial para fomentar la paz y el entendimiento entre las naciones. La diplomacia parlamentaria sirve como un canal para el diálogo, una plataforma donde convergen perspectivas en busca de un terreno común, trasciende fronteras e ideologías, reuniendo a representantes de diversas naciones para participar en un discurso constructivo tal y como estamos haciendo estos días todos nosotros aquí en Ginebra. Este es el valor de la Unión Interparlamentaria y el valor de esta diplomacia, la diversidad de opiniones y la libertad que nos proporciona el estar aquí como parlamentarios con nuestros pensamientos y convicciones propias, sino como representantes de un Gobierno. A través de esa diplomacia parlamentaria tenemos la oportunidad de construir puentes frente a aquellos que quieren construir o levantar muros. Podemos cultivar relaciones basadas en el respeto mutuo y la cooperación, en lugar de la sospecha y la hostilidad. Al forjar alianzas y fomentar el diálogo, sentamos las bases para una paz y prosperidad duraderas. Sin embargo, el camino hacia una diplomacia parlamentaria efectiva no está exento de desafíos. Requiere compromiso, paciencia y una disposición para escuchar. Exige que dejemos de lado nuestras diferencias y prioricemos el bienestar común de la humanidad. Como representantes de nuestras respectivas naciones, tenemos la responsabilidad de abogar por la diplomacia, sobre el desacuerdo, por el diálogo, sobre la división. Debemos esforzarnos por defender los principios de tolerancia, entendimiento y respeto en todas nuestras interacciones. En el contexto de España, la diplomacia parlamentaria desempeña un papel crucial en la promoción de la paz y el entendimiento a nivel internacional. Como miembro activo de la comunidad global, España ha demostrado siempre un compromiso constante con el diálogo y la cooperación entre naciones a través de de sus representantes parlamentarios. El Parlamento español, tanto el Senado, Cámara a la que tengo el orgullo de, de la que tengo el orgullo de formar parte, como el Congreso de los Diputados, participan en numerosas iniciativas diplomáticas que buscan promover la estabilidad y la resolución pacífica de conflictos en todo el mundo, a través de su participación en foros internacionales, intercambios parlamentarios y misiones diplomáticas. Los representantes españoles hemos trabajado siempre para construir, como decía antes, puentes con otras naciones y fomentar un diálogo constructivo. Además, España ha sido un defensor activo de la Unión Europea y sus esfuerzos en materia de diplomacia parlamentaria. Como país miembro, contribuye al fortalecimiento de las relaciones internacionales dentro del marco europeo, promoviendo valores compartidos de democracia, derechos humanos y cooperación multilateral. Otro de los aspectos que me gustaría poner aquí sobre la mesa hoy ante todos ustedes, distinguidos colegas, es el importante papel que puede jugar una actividad como puede ser el turismo, que puede desempeñar en la diplomacia parlamentaria por la paz y el entendimiento. Una actividad global, junto con toda su industria, que contribuye a promover el intercambio cultural, fomentar el diálogo entre países, sirve como herramienta para el desarrollo de territorios y personas y es capaz de construir puentes de cooperación. Al facilitar el contacto directo entre personas de diferentes naciones, el turismo puede contribuir a la comprensión mutua y el fortalecimiento de relaciones internacionales basadas en el respeto y la colaboración. Los parlamentarios podemos utilizar el turismo como una herramienta para promover la paz y el entendimiento al organizar viajes interparlamentarios, participar en conferencias internacionales y apoyar iniciativas que promuevan la cooperación y el desarrollo sostenible a través del turismo. Aprovechemos esta oportunidad que nos brinda la diplomacia parlamentaria para dar forma a un mundo de paz y entendimiento. Trabajemos juntos para construir esos puentes de los que no me cansaré de hablar, que abarquen continentes y culturas, fomentando un futuro donde la cooperación triunfe frente al conflicto. Ojalá dentro de unos meses sean muchas más personas las que construyan esos puentes en lugar de levantar muros. Ojalá y volvamos aquí de nuevo a Ginebra para poder hablar de muchos otros asuntos que preocupan al mundo y que merecen nuestra atención como parlamentarios para intentar entre todos lograr que el principal mandato de la política, que no es otro que el de trabajar para intentar mejorar la vida de los ciudadanos, la vida de las personas, se pueda cumplir. Porque no nos olvidemos, por favor, que detrás de cada una de nuestras palabras en este tipo de foros, detrás de cada debate sobre cualquier conflicto, detrás y alejados de esos egos de quienes los provocan, hay cientos de miles de personas, niños, jóvenes, mayores, hombres y mujeres, que sufren sus consecuencias y lo pasan mal. Tengámoslos siempre presentes. Nada más, muchas gracias. Thank you, Spain.
We now welcome Czech Republic to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed parliamentarians and honored guests. Today, I stand before you to discuss a topic of utmost importance, parliamentary diplomacy for peace. In a world where conflicts persist, where borders are contested, and where human suffering knows no boundaries, parliamentary diplomacy emerges as a beacon of hope and common sense. A bridge that connects nations, transcends differences, and fosters understanding. Parliamentary diplomacy is not merely a bureaucratic experience or exercise. It is a living force that builds bridges between countries and peoples. While diplomats navigate the intricate corridors of international relations, elected members of national parliaments, like us, play a crucial role from a human perspective. We are the voices of people representing our own nations. And I am sure that majority of our peoples wants and values peace above all else. Assembled here on, in Geneva, we complement the efforts of the United Nations and other multilateral forums. Our mission is clear, to engage in dialogue, foster understanding, and seek pathways to peace with respect to the international law. But unfortunately, there are many armed conflicts around the world where the diplomacy is not often enough. We Czechs are naturally very concerned with the unjust Russian aggression against Ukraine Yesterday, as well as today, there were Russian rocket and drone attacks on Ukrainian civilians and infrastructure. Again, one of many, with huge humanitarian consequences. I think it is thus our obligation to apply diplomatic pressure on the Russian Federation and remind them of the international law and order that we are all trying to build. And you all have the opportunity here to deliver uh, this message uh, to their delegation. Also, uh, the conflict in Gaza weighs heavily on our hearts. Such a suffering, such a loss of lives, such a history of violence and discord with a very little prospect of peaceful future. As difficult as this conflict is, and with no easy solution, we should at least support actions leading to necessary humanitarian relief, immediate release of hostages, ceasefire, delivery of humanitarian aid and assistance, and again, respect for the international law. Ladies and gentlemen, let us embrace parliamentary diplomacy as a force for good. Let us build bridges, heal wounds, strengthen international law, and champion just peace. For in our collective efforts lies the promise of a brighter, more harmonious world, one where international rules are being followed, human rights respected, dialogue triumphs over discord, and understanding prevails over hatred. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Czech Republic. We now welcome to this podium, Malaysia. Madam President, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to start by extending my profound gratitude for inviting the Parliament of Malaysia to the 148th IPU Assembly. My name is Zuraina Binti Musa. I'm a senator in the Malaysian Parliament. 
Parliamentary diplomacy is often regarded as a vital component of a nation's foreign policy. It plays a significant role in fostering peace, understanding and cooperation in the international stage. In Malaysia, members of parliament can engage in bilateral and multilateral diplomacy through various channels, including official visits, parliamentary delegations, parliamentary friendship groups, and participation in international and regional forums. I strongly believe parliaments have the responsibility and capabilities to build bridges and encourage peace globally. We can do this in three ways. One, our exchanges help bridge common understanding on how regulatory framework needs to be developed, fostering a conducive environment for international cooperation. Two, we have a role in preventing and addressing polarization along political, ethnic and gender lines in society. Three, we are a tool to ensure international observation and commitment to international laws and treaties. Moving to my first point, parliaments are the source of laws for all countries. It is through us that there is a check and balance of the execution in the laws that are being drafted. By ensuring that our parliamentarians are informed of the various laws and best practices of other countries, we are building a legislative body that is more informed and better equipped to scrutinize and harmonize domestic laws with international and regional laws and standards. Harmonizing domestic legislation with international standards and agreement facilitates a smoother international cooperation in several ways. It enhances trade and investment. It improves regulatory effectiveness and efficiency. And finally, it ensures enhanced global governance and promotes the rule of law. My second point, I would like to highlight that parliaments are able to help prevent and resolve polarization along political, ethnic and gender lines in society. The Parliament of Malaysia encourages inclusive political discourse by nurturing an environment where diverse voices and perspectives are heard and respected. This can be achieved through parliamentary debates, committees and forums that provide opportunities to, for members of parliament from different political parties, ethnic backgrounds and gender to engage in constructive dialogues on national issues. Therefore, in my eyes, parliamentarians are responsible in promoting tolerance, diversity and respect for human rights. My last point, Madam Chairman. Parliamentary diplomacy is a tool to address observation of international laws and treaties. In regard to conflict resolutions and mediation, parliamentarians of Malaysia act as an impartial actor working towards peaceful resolution and giving assistance without the needs of armed proliferations. For example, in a show of solidarity, both government and opposition members of parliament in Malaysia have contributed to the Humanitarian Trust Fund for the people of Palestine to support the Palestine cause. The Parliament of Malaysia has joined efforts to cease the suffering of innocent Pal Palestinians that are increasingly oppressed by the ongoing conflict and to demonstrate undivided moral support towards their plight for justice. Apart from that, our Prime Minister, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, during their ministerial question time, reiterated Malaysia's firm principle and position on the issue of Palestine-Israel conflict and called for immediate cessation of hostilities. In the same way, our Prime Minister also uses his platform in the Parliament to condemn unreservedly all forms of killings of women children and civilians by any party. As parliamentarians, we can and must foster this environment. Let us not allow our country to be complicit in crimes against humanity and violation of Jess Kogan international obligations. This is the key for regional and international stability, for peace of the world today and for the next generation. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. To summarize, I would like to reinstate that Parliament of Malaysia believes that parliamentary diplomacy enables legislations, legislators to advocate of, for human, human rights, 
democratic principles and the rule of law. We strongly believe that parliamentary diplomacy serves as a valuable tool for Malaysia in bridging the gap for global peace. With embracing the principles of peace, tolerance and cooperation through parliamentary diplomacy, Malaysian parliamentarians play a crucial role in shaping a more harmonious and interconnected world. We have to champion justice. I thank you. Thank you, Malaysia. We now welcome Suriname to the podium. I want to remind speakers to observe the five-minute time limit on your speeches, please. Madam President, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, today is the day of the Festival of Colors. Shub Holi to everyone. As we convene to elaborate on the theme of this general debate, it is imperative to recognize the different challenges faced faced by our global community, ranging from polarization to threats to international peace and security. However, merely acknowledging these issues without taking concrete actions falls short of affecting mean, meaningful chance. What is paramount in a concerned effort towards specific solution. In the pursuit of addressing these challenges, it is essential to emphasize the decisive role of parliamentary diplomacy in building bridges for peace and understanding. We stand as a critical juncture where meaningful action must be taken, where collaboration must transcend ideology defies and where empathy must guide our decision. While diversity in, in our opinions is inherent to our humanity, it is our collective responsibility to discern between constructive dialogue and harmful polarization. It is context initiative undertaken in Suriname to combat polarization through legal measures serve as a beacon of hope, understanding the imperative of holding individuals accountable for their actions. Furthermore, the unusual influence of social media that is necessary for a proactive approach in controlling the spread of prejudice by fostering empathy and promoting nuances discussions, we can mitigate the proliferation of misinformation and foster a culture of informed dialogue. Moreover, parliamentary cooperation, both at regional and international level, is dispensable in addressing pressing issues such as climate change, gender equality, equality and human rights. Suriname collaboration endorsed with esteemed organizations such, such as IPU, Paramericans, the UN, ex, ex, exemplify our commitment to collective action in pursuit of global prosperity. In addition to the collaborative efforts, Legislative stative measures play a decisive role in upholding international norms and fostering peace. Suriname's contribution to international treaties and its commitment, among other combating money laundering and terrorist financing, underscore our study dedicated to global security. This commitment is evident through our membership and participation in the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, 
Moreover, Suriname demonstrates its commitment to addressing challenges such as proliferation of small arms and ammunition by conducting accurate evaluation and adherence it to international protocol, Suriname remains steadfast in its commitment to promote regional stability. In conclusion, parliamentary diplomacy serves a base in fostering mutual understanding, dialogue, and cooperation. As we navigate the complexity of the modern world, let us remain resolute in our pursuit of peace guided by principle of empathy, collaboration, and enhance to international norm. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Suriname. We now welcome to the podium Honorable Singh of India. Honorable President, Secretary, Honorable Fellow Parliamentarians, good afternoon to all. It is indeed an honor to address this distinguished gathering on the theme of this conference. In this era of increasing interdependence and interconnectedness, the world today is faced with several transnational challenges. While addressing these complex challenges, Parliamentary diplomacy offers one more avenue for fostering collaboration, dialogue, and peace among nations. As we embark on this discourse, <laughs> I'm hopeful that it will afford us the opportunity to adopt a forward-thinking approach on how we can harness the transformative power of parliamentary diplomacy to shape a more harmonious and peaceful world. Basudhaya Kutumukam, that is, one earth, one family is the core value of Indian civilization. The theme of India's G20 presidency was one earth, one family, one future. The theme of this debate, that is building bridges for international peace, is reflected in this concept. As the mother of democracy, deliberative and advisory bodies have worked in India since ancient times. These deliberative bodies received foreign emissaries, including those from Greek and Roman empires, even in the third century BC. The famous Buddhist king Asok, around 220 BC, sent several ambassadors from India to Southeast Asia to spread the message of peace and non-violence. <laughs> Further, in 48 AD, Princess of Ajodhya, birthplace of our Lord Ram, went to South Korea to establish diplomatic relations and married their crown prince. Friends, the importance of parliamentary diplomacy in promoting international peace can hardly be overemphasized. Parliamentarians are uniquely positioned to influence government as well as the public opinion. Indian parliament plays an important role in shaping India's bilateral and multilateral relations effectively. Members of Indian Parliament engage, as elsewhere, actively in various diplomatic activities. They thereby have contributed to promoting global peace and prosperity by fostering dialogue and collaboration. India's G20 presidency in 2023 began with the theme, One Earth, One Family, One Future, at a time when the world as well as the G20 grouping was indeed very divided. India decided to put the interests and issues of the Global South right at the heart of G20 with an ambitious agenda with a view to nudging the otherwise binary discussions towards consensus. India successfully brought the weight of the Global South to G20, which in turn bridged the divide at the New Delhi summit. The future indeed belongs to the Global South, both demographically as well as economically and our vision for future must have this at its core. The ninth P20 summit hosted by India during its G20 presidency underscored our commitment to shaping the global order through consensus and collaboration. 
while inaugurating the conference, our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi said, I quote, a divided world cannot provide solutions to the major challenges facing humanity, unquote. This convergence of global leaders and parliamentarians highlighted the significant influence wielded by the collective voice of parliamentarians worldwide. Friends, our parliamentary delegation in various bilateral and multilateral fora have highlighted the need for reforming international governance structures, including UN Security Council and international financial institutions to reflect contemporary realities. In recent years, multilateral cooperation has encountered unprecedented crisis. While in the United Nations, the crisis has manifested in form of funds cut and ever-increasing policy paralysis in its Security Council, other institutions like Bretton Woods have faced a skepticism of effectiveness. The COVID-19 pandemic has also exposed vulnerabilities of the international system, particularly those of multilateral institutions. Besides, we should work for promoting and facilitating facilitating the showcasing of good practices on legislation and oversight. India believes in nurturing parliamentary partnership at the regional and international levels and is also ready to help other countries in capacity building by sharing its knowledge and experience. I reiterate the commitment of Indian Parliament to extending cooperation to international efforts towards maintaining peace and security. Thank you. Jai Bharat. Thank you. India, we now welcome Poland to the podium. Dear President, dear members of Parliament, dear friends, we gathered in this beautiful city of Geneva, headquarters of many international organizations, place where human rights and international humanitarian law has been implemented and has been put into action. Nevertheless, we are here not to talk about history. We are here to talk about future. As an international community, our priorities are clear. Democratic values, the rule of law, solidarity. These are not just empty slogans. In the Charter of the United Nations, we have declared we, the people of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. We, the people. We, the parliamentarians. As members of parliament, as politicians, we bear a special responsibility for words. Words can build bridges between states and between nations, but on the other hand, they can increase divisions. In our efforts, we'll be missing if we will use violence in political discourse if we will set nation against nation, the hatred in people will be growing. In a world full of challenges, the tensions we have to remember how important parliamentary dimension is, how important is the dialogue between us. In all these cases, when international law is being broken and human dignity is violated, we must react. Too weak words can have dangerous implications. They can be heard as a support of those who bring destruction to the world. And in this, I, what is actually happening now, what I hear every day about the war in Ukraine, to negotiate, to cease fire, to preserve peace. A brutal attack of Russian Federation on Ukraine is a violation of international law, and it is time we admit it. Poland is a country and the frontier of war, having a realistic view of the situation on our eastern border. We cannot idly watch as the world of our values is being destroyed. It's not only Ukraine, it's Middle East, it's Africa. How can we talk about peace when people are being murdered, tortured, raped and kidnapped? How can we talk about negotiations when human rights are violated? It has to stop. Words without actions meant nothing. That's why, as a part of international community, as a members of IPU, we should concentrate on actions. We have to inform, educate, testify, be witnesses, spokesperson for those who suffer. 
We have to be auditors of our governments and our colleagues' politicians. We have to encourage to engage in preventing conflicts and to end conflicts. We who were chosen by the people, we, were to be, we have to be guardian of peace. In this context, it's very disappointing that yesterday our community failed to uni unite and speak unanimously for a ceasefire and peace. This should be a lesson. Let's not be indifferent. It is our duty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Poland. Now welcome the Dominican Republic to the podium. Muy buenas tardes, presidente de esta asamblea, demás miembros de la mesa directiva. Muy buenas tardes a todos los parlamentarios de todas las naciones que se encuentran aquí reunidas en esta reunión y asamblea de la UIP. Es imposible nosotros iniciar nuestras palabras sin pedir la ayuda internacional para nuestra vecina República de Haití la cual hace cerca de tres, cuatro, cinco años ha venido en una degradación del Estado de Derecho y de los ciudadanos de la República, nuestra hermana República de Haití. Hace menos de, hace alrededor de un año hemos visto cómo han asesinado a su presidente, lo cual ha vuelto un caos ese país luego de la dimisión de ese presidente. La verdad que nosotros hemos pedido a todos los organismos internacionales la ayuda que ya no debe esperar para ese país, ya no debe esperar un día más para Haití. Son decenas de muertes cada día que hay en la República de Haití con un sinnúmero de bandas criminales que asesinan personas todos los días, todos los días, y no hay quien gobierne ahora mismo ese país, porque la realidad es que los mismos haitianos los que están buscando irse de su país porque ya no hay ningún tipo de seguridad que les garantice su vida. Y nosotros pedimos aquí, en esta gran asamblea del OIP, la intervención de todas sus naciones a través de las Naciones Unidas para que colaboren con la situación que tiene nuestra hermana República de Haití. De una manera pacífica, de una manera de, en orden, que podamos garantizar que ese país pueda recuperar la calma luego de tantos años que no ha podido vivir en paz. Llamamos a que las demás naciones puedan integrar una comisión que pueda solucionar y llamar a unas elecciones democráticas en dicho país para que pueda volver a ser Haití lo que alguna vez ha sido. La posición de la República Dominicana es la siguiente. Para la República Dominicana la estabilidad política y social de Haití es un asunto de seguridad nacional. Consideramos esencial que cualquier acuerdo de transición en Haití facilite el despliegue de una misión multinacional de apoyo a la seguridad en Haití, conforme al autorizado por la resolución 2699 del 2023 y 2700 del 2023 del Consejo de Seguridad de las Naciones Unidas. Desde hace más de tres años, el gobierno dominicano ha llamado reiteradamente la atención de la comunidad internacional sobre la crisis multidimensional en Haití, destacando que el deterioro de la seguridad había alcanzado niveles alarmantes. Esta es una crisis sin precedentes, exacerbada por la falta de institucionalidad, la violencia y la tardanza de una respuesta internacional. Dada nuestra historia 
y vecindad de la isla compartida, el gobierno dominicano desea reiterar que no puede ni debe involucrarse en decisiones internas que pertenecen exclusivamente al pueblo haitiano. República Dominicana respalda con absoluta firmeza las resoluciones 2645 del 2022, 2653 del 2022, 2692 del 2023, 2699 del 2023, 2700 del 2023, del Consejo de Seguridad de las Naciones Unidas y reclama su pleno cumplimiento. Es crucial que la misión multinacional de apoyo a la seguridad en Haití finalmente se despliegue a la mayor brevedad posible, para lo cual es imprescindible que los fondos prometidos se desembolsen inmediatamente. El proceso de transición en Haití debería incluir a las voces más significativas y representativas del pueblo haitiano que se distingan por su integridad ética y moral. Sobre todo, debe evitar cualquier curso de acción que contravenga o impida la implementación de las resoluciones relevantes del Consejo de Seguridad. Es necesario que la comunidad internacional apoye la conformación de un gobierno que represente la voluntad haitiana y que sea respaldado por el gobierno saliente para asegurar su legitimidad. Es importante garantizar que cualquier proceso de transición se adhiere al respeto de los derechos humanos, la voluntad popular y el restablecimiento de un marco básico de institucionalidad. República Dominicana reafirma su compromiso de continuar colaborando activamente dentro de sus posibilidades en beneficio de la estabilidad, la paz y la seguridad del pueblo haitiano. Para lograr estos objetivos es imprescindible el despliegue de la misión multinacional. El pueblo nacional no puede esperar un día más. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Dominican Republic. We now welcome the Honorable Kirova from Bulgaria. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable parliamentarians, as I begin my speech, I will first extend my greetings to every woman who upholds her role in contemporary society and fights against violence and war, as well as against stereotypes that pertain to the female class. As a woman parliamentarian, I cannot hide my deep concern of the polarizing world that we live in and the suffering of civilians, women and children in conflict zones and ongoing wars. Bulgaria is concerned with the current crisis of the rules-based international order and its negative effect on the functioning of multilateralism. Current international system is seriously challenged by the blatant violation of the international law. Bulgarian parliamentarians are firmly standing for taking the dialogue back to its previous priorities, which are peace, security, and reaching the sustainable development goals. Any attempt to reformulate or selectively apply the core principles embedded in the UN Charter should be strongly opposed. As parliamentarians, we carry an enormous responsibility since we have been empowered to take decisions and to take care of those who have chosen us, and furthermore, to those who do not have the power to stand for their rights, for their ideas, and for their concerns. No one here doubts the importance of our decisions, the power of our abilities to achieve understanding and good neighborliness, empathy for the war stricken regions, peace for the people in war conflicts, care for the vulnerable social groups, future for our children and our countries. Parliamentarians should be united in the quest for decisive steps and policies that might achieve lasting peace in a world 
fragmented by growing inequalities. This global fragmentation has caused not only anxiety and concern, but has also posed at the real threat of the principles of equal dignity and rights to all people and their ability to coexist peacefully. It is a duty to all parliamentarians to think strategically for decades to come, and at the same time to provide answers adequate to the challenges of today. Peace-building efforts need continuous dialogue, and this is where parliamentarian diplomacy comes to an act. Any conflict or open problem in the dynamics of the modern world might be solved through diplom diplomatic efforts. Parliamentary diplo diplomacy can and should answer the enormous expectations that it evokes. As it is previously stated by a colleague parliamentarian, parliamentary diplomacy is a beacon of hope. And I would add, it is a powerful weapon that can easily bring us on the table of negotiations by friendships that we create, by those personal relations that we form as members of parliaments. Using parliamentary diplomacy, we must feel the pulse of the events and find the intersection between our national interests and the common goals. We parliamentarians can use the tools of preventive diplomacy, and we should use it. As we are here, legislators representing different political systems and political views in the world, we have a unique platform for dialogue and parliamentary diplomacy. The meetings of our organization should serve as a place to coordinate new ideas and initiatives in the search for peace and progress. So let us talk, let us argue, let us fight on the way to finding solutions, not on the battlefield. Let us do it here. And here we should, should not fail to find solutions, as this, is, as this will result in prolonged suffering in the zones of conflict. Ours is the obligation and the great privilege, and above all, the responsibility to participate in the progress and process of discussing ideas, creating visions, and making global decisions to prevent and, when needed, to resolve conflicts. We have the power to make any difference in this world, and it is up to us how we use this power. Building bridges between people, institutions, parliaments, and various humanitarian organizations should be based on continuous dialogue, which excludes this division and which is only the first step towards achieving the rule of law, towards protecting human rights and values and making sure that the long-lasting peace is not only a word in the vocabulary or in a resolution, that it is an Speaker, act please bring your and a guarantee for our children and our countries. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bulgaria. We now welcome Honorable McGuinty from Canada. Here we go. Well, good afternoon, fellow parliamentarians and colleagues. The importance of parliamentary diplomacy, which is what this is all about this week, has long been recognized by the IPU. In fact, it inspired the IPU's very establishment in 1889. That's why it was created. But this Assembly's focus on parliamentary diplomacy is less a celebration then it is a very urgent reminder of both the challenges that lay before us and the contributions that we, as representatives for our peoples, are obliged to make. These challenges are based in conflict or a situation of incompatible interests, featuring what might be enduring misunderstanding and distrust. Conflict may or may not involve violence. It can be kinetic or cyber. It can be personal or communal. 
It doesn't respect state sovereignty or national borders. We're surrounded by conflict. Many of us live in conflict. So why is this the case? In my view, even when the world can access the most advanced communications technologies, when the world is the most interconnected it has ever been, there's a tendency to disconnect when we connect. More specifically, genuine mutual compassion and engagement is sorely lacking. The U.S. Surgeon General's 2023 advisory called attention to the epidemic of loneliness and isolation as an underappreciated public health crisis. The advisory said that relationships are a source of healing and well-being hiding in plain sight, one that can help us live healthier, more productive lives. My purpose in referring to that advisory is to emphasize that for this to have positive contributions to addressing conflicts, the dialogue's got to be meaningful, it's got to be authentic, and it's got to be truthful. There are no shortcuts. With parliamentary diplomacy, we need frank and fulsome discussions with each other. As parliamentarians, we don't need anyone's permission to use our voices in areas important to those we represent. Our governments cannot address conflict or promote security on their own. Intergovernmental processes alone are also insufficient. We've seen lots of that lately, haven't we? Parliamentary diplomacy has much to contribute as we seek ends to conflicts and improve security around the world. Let's look at the UN's 2030 Agenda and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals established in 2015. It seems pretty unlikely that the goals will be achieved by their deadline. As you've heard me say before, without doubt, these aspirational goals are both necessary because they help set a direction. But to be honest, parliamentarians are carrying out budgetary, legislative and oversight functions without comprehensive knowledge of what these SDGs really are. The global order is a work in perpetual progress. Progress requires honest, truthful and authentic discussions. We work together with Common Cause on shared goals because we know we have a special responsibility to the next generations. We better make sure that our kids don't have their natural affinity for the truth extinguished and that they have hope for their future. For me and probably all of us, this diplomacy is based on our common humanity. We have a tremendous responsibility and a consequential privilege to safeguard humanity's potential future in the face of all these incredible challenges. Make no mistake, the list of challenges is long. The potential for more division, not unity, is growing. This includes my own particular predilection for the threat of what I call our natural security and the limited carrying capacity of the planet, already leading, we know, to crop failures, loss of biodiversity, and climate refugees. We need to set in context what we spend on parliamentary diplomacy. Keep in mind the budget for the IPU is about $20 million a year. The cost of one Tomahawk missile, two to seven million dollars. The cost of one state-of-the-art leopard tank, between six and 17 million dollars. A ballistic missile, between 75 and 120 million US dollars. Do we still think this is expensive? No. Silence can lead to misunderstanding, mistrust and isolation, and mistakes and accidents. It can also lead to dangerous nationalism which can have devastating consequences for the people we represent. Silence is something we can't afford, so let's keep talking. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Canada. We welcome to the podium, Iraq. Asayda, 
توليا اكسون رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي السيدات والساده رؤساء البرلمانيات برلمانات ممثلي الوفود البرلمانيه سيد مارتن شونخ الامين العام لاتحاد البرلمان الدولي طيب الله اوقاتكم بكل خير بدايه وباسم الوفد العراقي يسعدني ان نعرب عن شكرنا وتقديرنا لتوجيه الدعوه لنا ونشعر بالسرور للحضور والمشاركه في اعمال الدوره ال 148 للاتحاد البرلمان الدولي والاجتماعات المصاحبه واليوم الفرصه متاحه وهناك امكانيه ومساحه جيده للنقاش والحوارات والتداول حول القضايا والملفات ذات الاهميه العاليه ان المحافظه على الاطار على اطر التوثيق الصله في العمل البرلماني والتاكيد على تقويه اداء البرلمانات وتفعيل الادوار والتمكين من ان تمثل جزءا كبيرا من الحلول للمشكلات التي يواجهها العالم اليوم والمساعده لتوجيه العمل من اجل تحقيق الاستقرار في المناطق الصراعات وتقديم العون بهدف التعمير بعد انتهاء الصراعات والازمات هي الاولويات والضرورات الانسانيه كما ان تعزيز الدبلوماسيه البرلمانيه في تطبيق مبادئ الاساسيه من اجل تطبيق من اجل تحقيق السلام والديمقراطيه وحمايه الحقوق الانسان والمساواه ومواجهة الآثار الاجتماعية جراء الحروب والصراعات واتخاذ القرارات بشأن المنظومات الذكاء الاجتماع الذكاء الاصطناعي وتحدياته في التطبيق الأمن السيبرياني وتوفير النظام لجمع البيانات الرقمية كما يجب أن تكون تلك الأنظمة ضد الاختراق ودعم الخصوصية للمساعدة على بناء أنظمة لها خصوصية عالية وحماية البيانات وتحصينها كما إن قضية التغيير المناخي والتحولات الطويلة الآجل في درجات الحرارة وأنماط الطقس باتت تشكل خطراً وتهديداً حقيقياً على الحياة البشرية ويجب أن نشير إلى أن التزام بتحقيق ركائز التنمية المستدامة من خلال الحوارات والتفاهمات والعمل البرلماني المشترك السادة الكرام إن إرادة أبناء بلد العراق وادي الرافدين أرض الحضارات والتاريخ العريق ومجلس النواب في دورته الحالية حريص على معالجة المعاناة العراقيين وتحقيق الحياة الكريمة وسنمضي باتجاه إقرار القوانين والتشريعات لتصل إلى مستوى الحياة الكر... إلى مستوى القوانين العالمية والدولية ونعمل على ترسيخ العدالة الاجتماعية وفرض سلطة القانون على الجميع وتطبيق الدستور ودعم الحقوق الإنسان وحماية الأسرة من النساء والأطفال وكبار السن وإنجاز القوانين التي تحمي هذه الشرائع شرائح من المجتمع وتفعيل الاتفاقيات الصداقة مع جميع البرلمانات والعمل على إنهاء الأزمات وتأثيرات الحروب والخلافات التي تتجاوز الحدود وتصل لكافة البلدان والجميع يدرك بأن العراق هو بوصلة الشرق الأوسط بتاريخه وفكره وحضارته ودوره المحوري في المنطقة ومن هنا نطالب من الدول الأصدقاء والبرلمانات الاتحاد بالوقوف معنا لمنع تجاوزات الدول الجوار على السيادة الوطنية وضمان حصة العراق المائية لا سيما ونحن مقبلون على فصل الصيف الحضور الكريم إننا نتطلع ومن هذا المحفل الدولي وندعو البرلمانات إلى التدخل السريع لإيقاف الحرب ونزيف الدم الفلسطيني في قطاع الغزة والعمل على سبيل إدخال مساعدات الإنسانية العاجلة لها لهم وإنقاذ الأطفال من آثار القصف والدمار إن الشرعية الدولية ومعها كل الشعوب الحرة التي تؤمن بالعدل والإنسانية على امتداد الأرض تطالب بإقامة دولة فلسطين وعاصمتها القدس الشريف وحماية الفلسطينيين من آثار المستوطنات والمعابر والسياسات التجويع واعتقال الشباب وعلينا أن ندرك جميعا وعلينا أن ندرك جميعا بأن الاستقرار بأن الاستمرار بتجاهل الحقوق المشروعة للشعب الفلسطيني لا ينتج إلا المزيد من العنف والأزمات وعدم الاستقرار في المنطقة والعالم ختاما علينا اليوم أن نبذل المزيد من الجهود لتحقيق أهداف الاتحاد البرلمان الدولي من أجل السلام والديمقراطية في عصر عصر الرقمنة الإلكترونية ودور التجارة والاستثمار في تحقيق الأهداف التنمية المستدامة وحماية حقوق الإنسان والمساواة بين الجنسين 
وتمكين الشباب والمساعدة في التحكيم لحل النزاعات لذا نحن بحاجة إلى رفع مستوى التعاون والتنسيق العالي بين البرلمانات وتبادل أفضل للممارسات البرلمانية وعبر اللجان الفاعلة والتأكيد على احترام القانون الدولي الإنسانية تحية والاحترام والتقدير لجميع الحضور ونشكركم على حسن الاستماع والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, Iraq. We now welcome Honorable Scriver from Denmark. Thanks for the floor. Dear colleagues, looking at the world situation today makes me concerned. Not long ago, there was a widespread belief that wars and conflicts were becoming a thing of the past. However, the reality proves otherwise. We are now witnessing numerous conflicts leading to an increasingly insecure world. This leads to fear and unease among our populations, also in Denmark. My primary, primary aim as a parliamentarian is to contribute to the creation of a better society, both in the present and for the future. This entails providing opportunities for the new generations, first and foremost in my own country. Nevertheless, in today's interconnected world, decisions made within our borders impact other nations, whether it's regarding climate action or advancements in artificial intelligence. One of the key solutions lies in fostering dialogue, a strength that I believe the Interparliamentarian Union exemplifies. Recently, some friends of mine asked me about my work in the IPU and what is it good for. I had to recognize that the outcome of our dialogues may not always be easy to quantify. However, I'm concerned that engaging in meaningful discussions about common challenges to find common solutions remains vital. Dialogue is sometimes difficult, but without dialogue, we will not be able to agree about anything. When I think about the dis discussion yesterday about the emergency item, I also think that we here in this room have something to learn according to dialogue and agreements. Because I think that these international conversations and discussions, like the ones we're having here, ought to culminate in agreements. However, the true value of these agreements lies in the implementation. We must therefore commit ourselves to fulfilling our obligations and be willing to make compromises, especially when negotiating across borders and interests. Drawing from my experience as a former school teacher, I understand the significance of merging various perspectives to foster unity. Reflecting on my time in the classroom, I often think about the young minds I've taught. Their future must remain at the forefront of our endeavors, motivating us to prioritize collaboration and honor our commitments. Moreover, it's imperative for all of us, including my own country, to engage in introspection. We must recognize and address the challenges faced by others across the globe, recognizing that not everyone views the world through the same lens as us. This requires setting aside preconceptions and fostering trust among nations. Ultimately, to prevent my concerns from getting real, it is paramount that we come together, driven by the ambition to secure a better future for our children and grandchildren. By demonstrating the power of dialogue and the importance of upholding agreements, we can instill hope in the younger generation and pave the way for a brighter future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Denmark. We now welcome Honorable Magama from the United Republic of Tanzania. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. On the outset, allow me to congratulate Dr. Tulia Axon, President of the IPU, and all members of the Bureau for being entrusted with this enormous responsibility. On behalf of Tanzania delegation, I command her and IPU Secretary General and their team 
for the exemplary manner in which all of them continue to guide the proceedings of this global forum. Madam President, the main theme of the assembly is parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. The primary goal of, of parliamentary diplomacy is to facilitate international cooperation, resolve conflicts, and pre pre prevent escalation of tensions through dialogue and negotiations. It provides a platform for the lawmakers to engage in discussions, exchange of ideas, and work towards common solutions to global issues. Madam President, parliamentary diplomacy in Tanzania's context plays a crucial role in building bridges for peace and understanding within the country and beyond. Tanzania is a diverse country with numerous ethnic and tribal groups. Parliamentary diplomacy can promote dialogue, understanding and cooperation among these groups, fostering a sense of national unity and harmony. Lawmakers can engage in discussions and uh, legislative initiatives that, that promote inclusivity, respect for cultural diversity, and equal representation of different communities. Parliamentary diplomacy can also contribute to peaceful elections and political stability. Lawmakers can engage in dialogue and the negotiation to address electoral disputes, promote fair and transparent electoral process, and work, and work towards political consensus. Parliamentary committee focused on electoral reforms and democratic governance can play a vital role in this regard. In terms of conflict resolutions and reconciliation, Tanzania has experienced internal conflicts in certain regions, especially among farmers, pastoralists, and miners. Parliamentary diplomacy can, can, can facilitate dialogue and reconciliation efforts between conflicting parties, helping to resolve disputes and heal divisions. Lawmakers can further engage in legislative reforms that address the root cause of the conflicts. Tanzania as a part of various regional organizations, such as the Eastern African Community and the Southern African Development Community, parliamentary diplomas can strengthen Tanzanians' engagement within these regional frameworks, fostering cooperation, mutual understanding, and peace, peace building. Lawmakers can participate in regional parliamentary forums, joint committees, and working groups to address common challenges and promote regional integration. Tanzania law lawmakers do engage with their counterparts from other countries, participate in international parliamentary assemblies, and contribute to global discussions on peace, security, and development. Through diplomatic initiatives, Tanzania parliamentarians can promote understanding, cooperation, and a positive engagement with the international community. Lastly, parliamentary diplomats can support legislative reforms that promote human rights, equality, and justice in Tanzania. Lawmakers can engage in discussions, consultations, and legislative processes to enact laws that protect human rights, address discrimination, and ensure the, the rule of law. This can contribute to a more inclusive and peaceful society. Madam President, to conclude, in Tanzania's context, parliamentary dip diplomacy can serve as a bridge-building mechanism, fostering peace, understanding, and cooperation among diverse communities, promoting political stability, and contributing to regional and international relations. Madam President, as I conclude, allow me again to reiterate my appreciation for the opportunity and I beg to submit, thank you, Asante Sana, merci beaucoup, muchas gracias. Thank you, Tanzania. Honorable Yakovei de France, vous avez la parole.
Madame la Présidente, Mesdames et Messieurs les parlementaires, mes chers collègues, le concept de diplomatie parlementaire ne va pas de soi, car la diplomatie, fonction régalienne, est traditionnellement le domaine privilégié du pouvoir exécutif. Mais en France, comme ailleurs, le Parlement s'est progressivement imposé dans ce champ, permettant l'affirmation d'une diplomatie parlementaire dont la vocation n'est pas de concurrencer la diplomatie officielle des gouvernants, mais bien de la compléter. Les parlementaires bénéficient de la légitimité que leur confère l'élection. Représentants des peuples, ils sont naturellement les mieux placés pour connaître et exprimer leurs attentes. Par ailleurs, s'ils ne sont pas des diplomates de carrière, les parlementaires ont une liberté de ton que leur donne une marge de manœuvre particulière quand celle de l'exécutif est souvent limitée et contrainte. La diplomatie parlementaire s'exerce d'abord au sein de nos parlements, mais bien sûr aussi dans le cadre des assemblées interparlementaires. L'UIP, qui est la plus ancienne des assemblées, et la seule dont la vocation est mondiale et universelle, a été créée il y a 135 ans par deux parlementaires, un français et l'autre britannique, avec un but que je rappelle, promouvoir la paix par le dialogue interparlementaire. La diplomatie parlementaire est donc l'essence même de notre organisation. Et c'est nous qui en sommes les acteurs, à travers nos débats et nos échanges, y compris dans les formats les plus informels. L'UIP joue un rôle essentiel pour maintenir le dialogue avec les, dans les conflits et les crises internationales, malgré les obstacles, malgré les, les réticences des partis, malgré les crispations géopolitiques et les atteintes de plus en plus fréquentes au droit international et au multilatérisme. Dans un monde où les guerres font rage, où les défis globaux se multiplient, la diplomatie parlementaire peut être un atout majeur, une carte à jouer en faveur de la paix et de la sécurité. J'espérais, chers collègues, vivement que cette 148e Assemblée de l'UIP nous permettrait d'en démontrer l'utilité et la pertinence, en nous unissant pour adopter un point d'urgence sur la situation humanitaire à Gaza et sur le sort des otages. La crise qui se déroule actuellement au Moyen-Orient, mais aussi en Ukraine, avec l'agression illégale de la Fédération russe, appelait une position forte de l'UIP. Nous avons tenté hier un rapprochement entre deux projets de résolution sur la situation à Gaza, qui présentaient des points de convergence évidents, et nous étions mis d'accord sur l'essentiel, un cessez-le-feu immédiat pour protéger les civils, la libération de tous les otages, l'accès immédiat et sans entrave à l'aide humanitaire et le respect du droit international. Nous étions d'accord, nous étions tous sur le point de conclure, mais au dernier moment, de nouvelles conditions qui on sont sortis du chapeau et qui pourtant ne figuraient sur aucun des projets de résolution, ont été exprimés et ont tout fait échouer. Face à cet échec cuisant de la diplomatie parlementaire, qui s'ajoute à celui de Luanda, ce que nous éprouvons, c'est du dépit et de la tristesse. Notre incapacité à délivrer un message fort et à partager à nos gouvernements ne fait que refléter les divisions et l'impuissance de la communauté internationale face à cette tragédie. Mais il faut l'admettre ici à Genève, dans le cadre de notre union interparlementaire, nous n'avons pas été à la hauteur de l'enjeu et du drame humanitaire qui se déroule en ce moment. Pourtant, nous sommes les représentants du peuple. Nous avons donc la responsabilité d'être à la hauteur de leurs attentes et de leurs souffrances. Tirons-en les conséquences. Faisons en sorte que l'histoire ne se répète pas une nouvelle fois lors de la prochaine Assemblée Générale. Je vous remercie. Merci, France. We now welcome to the podium Honorable Nier, Singapore. Madam President, Madam Secretary and colleagues, I am Vikram Naya, a member of parliament from Singapore and chair of the government parliamentary committee for defense and foreign affairs. Building bridges is more important than ever before. The United Nations was formed in the aftermath of World War II to create an institution and a framework of rules to protect humankind from the enormity of war. Now, some eight decades later, is this order under threat? Every time a major power appears to disregard international law, the order itself is threatened. The victims of such conduct 
may feel the temptation to respond in kind, also with disregard to international law. Some of the countries that have been mentioned as violating international law in the course of these debates have also themselves been victims of such violations. While there may be a temptation to disregard international law, especially where one has been a victim of violations, each of us should recognize that if this order breaks down, every country would be worse off. Singapore is unwavering in its commitment to international law and the multilateral rules-based order. Related to this, a number of speakers have lamented the failure of international organizations to act in the face of violations of international law. And some have even mentioned the failure of the IPU to pass a resolution on the Middle East as a failure of this institution. I understand this sentiment, but I have a little more optimism in the institutions. In yesterday evening's debate over the emergency motions, two motions, the one by South Africa and the one by Denmark, each with a different group of nations behind them, garnered significant support but each missing out on adoption by a relatively small number of votes. The tone of the debate was impassioned, and while both motions had very significant points of agreement, the points of disagreement were felt strongly enough by those that advocated for one motion, voted against the other. Does this mean the IPU as an institution has failed? I do not think so. Ultimately, international institutions can only work through a broad consensus. And if there is no consensus, then it means the relevant resolutions would not go through. As politicians, many of us are advocates and good at arguing for positions. Sometimes, though, our passion and advocacy makes compromise difficult. We have to recognize this and support those who make compromises to build consensus. Even if we fail to get consensus, the process of getting there is just as important. Both the resolutions by South Africa and Denmark call for the upholding of international law and recognize the need for urgent action to protect civilians in the Gaza. If individual parliamentarians carry the same conviction to their home countries and make the same case as passionately at home as they did in the IPU, I think this effort is not wasted. Many thanks to everyone who put in the time, effort and energy to try and reach a consensus. If possible, we should exchange friendly words with those who disagreed with us in the debate and reaffirm our common ground rather than our differences. I hope we can all be advocates for these common principles of humanity and respect for international law in our respective homes. Thank you. Thank you, Singapore. We now welcome to the podium, Peru. Gracias, Presidente. Estimados representantes de la Unión Interparlamentaria, es un honor estar aquí hoy para discutir uno de los pilares fundamentales de la cooperación internacional, la diplomacia parlamentaria. William Randall Kramer, uno de los fundadores de la UIP, decía que la diplomacia parlamentaria es la vía más efectiva para construir un mundo de diálogo y entendimiento mutuo. Y en ese camino, los parlamentarios desempeñamos un papel crucial ya que representamos la voz de nuestros ciudadanos, no solo al interior de nuestros países, sino también a nivel internacional. Esto quiere decir que como parlamentarios debemos aplicar la diplomacia parlamentaria para mantener la democracia, los derechos humanos y el Estado de Derecho. En mi experiencia como Presidente del Congreso de la República del Perú durante el periodo 2021-2022, advertí el peligro en el que se encontraba la democracia peruana debido al gobierno del expresidente y ahora procesado judicialmente Pedro Castillo, que no respetaba las instituciones democráticas ni la separación de poderes e intentó cerrar el Congreso arbitrariamente. Incluso en el 2022, una misión de la Organización de los Estados Americanos visitó el Perú a solicitud del exmandatario golpista Pedro Castillo para supuestamente reunirse con diversos representantes. Sin embargo, llamó la atención que a pesar que me desempeñé como presidenta del Congreso durante el primer año de gobierno y que en ese momento era presidenta de la Comisión de Relaciones Exteriores, no me citaron para recoger mis opiniones sobre la crisis política que se vivía en el país y tampoco aceptaron mi solicitud de reunión, pese a que fui aludida en la carta que remitió el gobierno de Castillo a la OEA. Por lo que gracias a la diplomacia parlamentaria, 
aquí en la UIP, UIP conocí al senador paraguayo Blas Llano, ex presidente de GRULAC, quien realizó las gestiones para que me concedan una reunión en la misión de la OEA. En dicha reunión conversé y expliqué con sustento la verdadera situación política que afrontaba el Perú en ese entonces. Quiero expresarles que desde el Parlamento peruano se han adoptado medidas conducentes a la paz para limitar acciones arbitrarias del anterior mandatario y de esa manera evitamos un golpe de Estado. Puedo afirmar con total seguridad que si no lo hubiéramos impedido, ninguna delegación peruana democrática estaría hoy presente ante la UIP. Cabe manifestar que el Perú actualmente tiene estabilidad política y económica, lo cual ha permitido que se fomente la inversión e incluso hace unos días el Perú se consagró como ganador para hacer la sede de los Juegos Panamericanos en el 2027. Y en octubre y noviembre de este año se va a realizar la reunión de la CEPAL y de APEC respectivamente. Es por ello que exhorto a esta importante organización a mantenerse vigilantes frente a todo lo que ocurre en los países miembros de la UIP, porque la paz no se limita únicamente a la ausencia de conflictos bélicos, sino que se fundamenta en la estabilidad política de, su, de un país. Desde este importante espacio debemos mantenernos firmes y unidos para condenar todo acto que vaya en contra del respeto a la democracia y el Estado de Derecho. Por eso es muy importante que la UIP, desde sus distintas comisiones y dentro de los objetivos comunes que compartimos, se pronuncie siempre de manera contundente y con la claridad que la defensa de la democracia requiere. No podemos ser débiles ante los ataques al Estado de Derecho. Los enemigos de la democracia no merecen ninguna consideración y no podemos ser permisivos con quienes pretenden destruir el ordenamiento constitucional en nuestros países. La diplomacia parlamentaria no puede servir a los intereses del gobierno de turno, sino que ésta debe perseguir principios innegociables como el respeto a los derechos humanos, a las instituciones democráticas y al equilibrio de poderes. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Peru. We now welcome the speaker from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Madame la Présidente de l'Union interparlementaire, Mesdames et Messieurs les Présidents des Parlements, distingués invités, Mesdames et Messieurs, je prends ici la parole au nom de la République démocratique du Congo, dont je suis le chef de délégation à cette 148e Assemblée de l'Union interparlementaire. Au nom de cette délégation, je m'empresse donc de vous féliciter, Madame la Présidente, pour votre brillante élection à la présidence de notre organisation. Nous félicitons également les organisateurs de cette 148e Assemblée de l'Union interparlementaire pour les thèmes choisis, la diplomatie parlementaire tissée des relations pour promouvoir la paix et la compréhension. Il s'agit d'un thème qui sonne d'une façon particulière pour la République démocratique du Congo mon pays, parce que la RDC, située au cœur du continent africain, est entourée de neuf autres pays voisins avec lesquels il entretient de très bonnes relations. Et la RDC, depuis l'indépendance, s'est investie dans une diplomatie de la paix et de la compréhension, non seulement sur le continent, mais également ailleurs, où des missions de médiation ont été conduites. La diplomatie parlementaire a ceci d'important qu'elle tient à compléter la diplomatie classique. Mais contrairement à la diplomatie classique, la diplomatie parlementaire est l'œuvre des élus, des représentants légitimes des peuples. C'est une démocratie qui se caractérise aussi par la vérité et une démocratie qui doit éviter le double langage. Cette remarque est particulièrement importante pour la République démocratique du Congo, mon pays où la paix est devenue une denrée rare, tout simplement, essentiellement du reste, à cause des immenses ressources naturelles dont regorge mon pays. Mais la RDC est également victime, on l'a dit à plusieurs reprises, elle est victime de l'agression de la part du Rwanda à travers le mouvement terroriste du M23. On n'a pas besoin de répliques ici parce que le Rwanda viendra lui-même à la tribune. Je voudrais ici, à la face du monde, 
apporter d'abord un cinglat démenti à la rhétorique répétée dans toutes les assemblées par le Rwanda. Dans notre pays, plus de 12 millions de personnes ont été tuées, plus de 10 millions de personnes déplacées, des femmes égorgées, des femmes et des enfants sur les routes de l'Est du pays. Tout ça à cause de cette agression. Voilà l'argumentaire tech qu'il est généralement fourni et que je voudrais ici écraser. Le Rwanda est en RDC en vertu de quel principe de droit international Le droit international est fondé sur des principes sacro tels que le respect de la souveraineté des États et de l'intégrité territoriale. Qu'est-ce qui peut justifier un État à porter des missiles solaires sur un territoire étranger On a souvent parlé de FDLR, des génocidaires. Mais c'est la communauté internationale qui avait forcé la République démocratique du Congo à recevoir ceux qui avaient commis le, le génocide au Rwanda. Ils ne sont pas venus à la demande de la RDC. C'est la communauté internationale qui est donc responsable. Ils sont venus depuis 1990, 90. Dieu seul sait combien il la reste. Et mon pays, dans la recherche de la paix, a autorisé l'armée rwandaise à entrer sur son sol pour combattre les, géno les fameux génocidaires. À plus de trois fois, ils sont entrés avec l'autorisation, ils sont sortis pour dire que la mission était terminée. D'où vient donc cette invocation de FDLR Mais nous, nous connaissons la raison fondamentale. C'est le pillage des ressources naturelles dont rigole la RDC. C'est tout. Et c'est pour cela que nous félicitons les parlementaires d'autres pays qui ont levé la voix de la RDC dans leur parlement, des collègues belges, français et ailleurs, pour dénoncer ce qui se passe dans mon pays. La véritable raison reste donc le pillage des ressources naturelles. Et nous dénonçons ici le protocole signé par l'Union européenne avec le Rwanda pour l'exploitation des ressources naturelles, alors que l'Union européenne sait très bien que ces ressources-là ne se retrouvent pas au Rwanda. Mais Madame la Présidente, nous croyons à la diplomatie parlementaire, c'est pourquoi nous sommes à ce forum et nous voudrons qu'une fois pour toutes, grâce à la diplomatie parlementaire, il soit mis fin à l'agression rwandaise, que la paix revienne en République démocratique du Congo et que notre pays puisse donner à l'Afrique toutes ces ressources qui peuvent servir à la renaissance africaine. Je vous remercie. Thank you, DRC. We now welcome to the podium Turkey. Dear Chair, dear colleagues, we are meeting at a time when international rule-based order is seriously undermined. The dire humanitarian situation in Gaza is worsening day after day. We are facing many other crises that are increasingly complex and interconnected. From conflicts and terrorism to climate change, from Islamophobia to pandemics and poor scarcity, by their nature and global scope, all these challenges must be tackled jointly. No country by itself, no matter how powerful, is able to fully face these challenges. Nevertheless, our world today is more fragmented and polarized than ever. Therefore, we find the theme of this general debate quite timely and relevant. Dear colleagues, Actions speak louder than words. Yesterday was not a testimony to the role that this august body should play. Unfortunately, we once again failed to find the common ground to take necessary action on the dire humanitarian situation still unfolding in Gaza. We are talking fancy words here in Geneva while women and children dying in Gaza. We should take a clear stance on one point. Creating hierarchy among civilians is yet another manifestation of racism. Double standards over Palestinian lives and rights are glaring. Some of the interventions of yesterday added insult to injury in this regard. Moral, legal, and political bankruptcy of some countries and our institutions over Gaza will have consequences for years to come. The first being the erosion of trust and confidence of people in our institutions around the world. What is the point of having a universal parliamentarian forum 
if it does not serve for the purpose of addressing most urgent issues concerning all of us. A call for ceasefire by IPU would have been most likely ignored by the aggressor, as it didn't even take heed on the interim measures ordered by the International Court of Justice. Nevertheless, we couldn't even make just a call. Dear colleagues, we should work on better leveraging parliamentary diplomacy in the service of peace and understanding. The unprecedented devastation inflicted on Palestinians over the past six months by the indiscriminate attacks of Israel in Gaza has outraged the conscience of humanity. People in Gaza are dying not only from bombs and bullets, but from lack of food and clean water, hospitals without power and medicine. Unfortunately, the international community is not rising up to the challenge in the face of Israeli regime's unlawful and unrestrained attacks against civilians. Current international mechanisms fail to provide timely and adequate responses, opening serious wounds in our collective conscience. The United Nations Security Council is tasked with maintaining international peace and security. Yet, it was left paralyzed due to use, or threat to use, the veto power by permanent members. It has failed even to call for a ceasefire. It is common and justified expectation of the international community to make the UN Security Council more representative, more democratic, and more effective. Our president underlines this at the highest level with the motto, the world is bigger than five. Dear friends, since the beginning of the current situation in Gaza, Turkey has been making great efforts to ensure an immediate ceasefire, to deliver humanitarian aid, and to prevent further escalation of the conflict in the region. Our parliament fully supports these efforts and voices the concerns of the Turkish people. Turning back to the point where I started, I should underline that no country alone could address the ongoing humanitarian crisis and find a solution. To restore public confidence in our institutions, we should merge and double our efforts towards ensuring justice and building a lasting peace. Thank you. Thank you, Turkey. We now welcome to the podium Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues, I stand here before you as a parliamentarian, as an Israeli, as a proud Jew, as a woman, but first and foremost, as a mother of two daughters. I am here today to be the voice of 19 women who have no voice and are being held in Gaza as hostages for the past 171 days. That is, along with 115 other hostages, among them two babies, Kfir, a one-year-old, and Ariel, a four-year-old. Shiri, Carmel, Noah, Inbar, Arbel, Ofra, Amit, Eden, Doron, Eden, Judy, Romi, Liri, Agam, Karina, Naama, Daniela, Shani, and Maya. I am here to be your voice. I am here to remind the world you are still there. I am here to talk about the hell you're going through in the dark tunnels of Hamas and about the horrific use of sexual assault as a weapon of war on October 7th, and unfortunately, right now, in Gaza. I am here to tell you we did not forget about you. 
for one second, and we will not stop until your return. No woman anywhere in the world deserves to be sexually assaulted. It doesn't matter which nationality or religion you are. You deserve to be back home with your families and loved ones, and we think of you and pray for you every second of every day. As an advocate for women's rights, I issued letters to many women's organizations around the world, including UN Women, asking them to speak up and stand by the innocent Israeli women who went through rape, mutilation, abuse, and gender-based violence, but no one spoke up. We stood alone. Only in the beginning of March did the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict publish a report saying that there are reasonable grounds to believe that conflict-related sexual violence occurred in multiple locations, including rape and gang rape, in at least three locations in southern Israel on October 7th. I thank them for this important step, and I hope it is only the first step. I call on all women parliamentarians here in this assembly and around the world to join me to speak up on behalf of women's rights, on behalf of the innocent women who were murdered after they were raped, on behalf of those who survived, and on behalf of our women hostages who are going through this in Gaza right now. Let us not forget that terror groups around the world draw inspiration from these horrific crimes and without a doubt will imitate this in other areas as well. The October 7th massacre is and forever will be a stark reminder of the devastation, extremism, and the terrorism leave in their wake. On that day, innocent lives were lost, families were shattered, and communities scarred by senseless violence. As we remember and honor the victims, it is crucial to address the underlying issues, including Iran's role in regional, regional and global terrorism. Iran's support for extremist groups have been a major contributor to the perpetuation of violence and chaos in the region. The backing of terror organizations like Hamas, Hezbollah, and Houthi movement are mil malicious across the Middle East have fueled conflicts, leading to countless casualties and widespread suffering. This cannot continue. The Islamic Republic of Iran needs to be held accountable. The October 7th massacre serves as yet another grim example of how terrorism knows no boundaries and the urgent need to confront its root causes. Absent an ironclad determination to tackle terrorism and its sponsors, it will be virtually impossible to promote and implement a peaceful vision for the Middle East. It is essential to emphasize the importance of the enduring unity and cooperation between nations. The Abraham Accords and the Negev Forum, which have brought together Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco, demonstrate the power of diplomacy and dialogue in fostering Speaker, peace please and bring stability. Your to a close. These agreements continue to represent a beacon of hope and an alternative in a region often plagued by tensions and conflicts. Building bridges for peace and understanding requires close collective efforts and an unwavering commitment to pursuing a better tomorrow, no matter how challenging. We must remain vigilant, and there are those who seek to destroy these bridges and saw discord among nations. Thank in you, honoring, Speaker. I'm finishing in a second. In honoring the memory of the victims of the horrific slaughter of October 7th, let us renew our commitment to combating terrorism in all its forms, 
Let us draw inspiration for the hope of the Abraham Accords and the promise of the Negev Forum. Let us work together as a region where cooperation, mutual respect, and peaceful coexistence prevail. Let us pledge to stand united against terrorism and build a, war, a world characterized by security and prosperity, and not hatred and war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Israel. We now welcome to the podium Italy. Thank you very much. The desire to raise the level of interparliamentary dialogue in order to work towards peace, development, and mutual understanding has become a priority mission today. For two reasons. Firstly, because the crisis in the mechanism of international cooperation is there for all to see. And given that the IPU was established precisely on the concept of multilateralism, we cannot but be very concerned at witnessing this gradual hollowing out of the power of multilateral organization. Secondly, because conflicts are rampant and many of them violate a wide range of human rights by disregarding respect for international treaties and conventions. Over the years, the IPU, as a forum for informal parliamentary diplomacy, has played an essential role, certified by many fundamental steps. Parliaments have often been at the center of global politics, creating new spaces for dialogue open to the input of a broader spectrum of political forces, not necessarily governmental, and succeeding in achieving concrete results even where traditional diplomacy had encountering contingent difficulties. This is the main added value of parliamentary diplomacy, voicing points of view that official governments, official cannot or do not want to convey, multiply the political players capable of acting on the international stage, keeping channels of discussion open, seeking common ground to bring different cultural and sensibilities closer together. The age of multilateralism is precisely seized, finding neutral fora where to settle conflicts. And although the responses are not always immediate, they can still lead to concrete success over time. This approach is all the more urgent today, not only because many of the current conflict are once again being re resolved through the use of a force, but above all because many people view the regulatory function of international forum and meeting almost with annoyance. The continuing war in Ukraine with the constant risk, the constant risk of escalation the tragic events following a mass brutal attacks against the State of Israel, which has brought the Israeli-Palestinian issues that we all had culpably removed from the multilateral, multilateral agenda of international politics, back to the far front and the many hotbeds in many other parts of the world which eat the headlines way less often, require that we take a strong stance and make a truly, truly incisive and constant commitment. What happened, my dear friends, yesterday 
what happens here yesterday shows that this crisis affects IPU too, which hasn't been able to approve a resolution on such an important humanitarian issues in Gaza. The words aren't useful. The presidency of IPU has to reflect seriously and propose solution for the future. Parliaments have a duty not to remain subordinate to the approach of governments, to take a stand and condemn what is not acceptable. They have a duty to recognize with increasing awareness the added, the added value of their presence in international fora. They have, they have a duty to exercise their legislative function by stimulating and giving political direction to prevent and respond effectively to the magnitude of these challenges by engaging, engaging in mutual listening and developing a common position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Italy. I want to remind speakers to please observe the five-minute time limit on speeches. We now welcome to the podium Qatar. أصحاب أصحاب المعالي والسعادة رأس البرلمانات والوفود المشاركة في هذا الاجتماع الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يطيب لي أصالة عن نفسي ونيابة عن وفد مجلس الشورى المشارك في اجتماعات الجمعية العامة الثامنة والأربعين بعد المئة للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي أن أحييكم وأعرب لكم عن سعادتي باللغاء بكم لبحث ومناقشة مسألة هامة ووجودها تستغيم حياة البشر وفي غيابها يفسد الكون إنها جسور السلام والتفاهم والحوار الأخوة والأخوات لا تطاوعني نفسي ولا يستكين ضميري عند تعداد محاسن وفضاء السلام وبناء جسوره وإغامة عمادة ونحن اليوم نشاهد أكبر جريمة يشهدها التاريخ في غياب السلام جريمة ينتهك فيها السلام وتسحق الإنسانية أمام مرأة ومسمع المجتمع الدولي في عصر الفضاء المفتوح الذي أزاح الستر عن زيف شعارات العدالة والمساواة والحرية وحق تغرير المصير لجميع الشعوب فقد أخرج الكيان المحتل للأراضي الفلسطينية المحتلة لسانه متهكما على جميع القيم والمبادئ الإنسانية والقيم التي نادت بها الشعوب وتواضعت الدول والحكومات على تطبيقها بين الحربين العالميتين إننا نشاهد كل الانتهاكات والاعتداءات على حقوق الشعب الفلسطيني من خلال المجازر الدموية التي تحصد أرواح آلاف من الشهداء المدنيين الأبرياء من الأطفال والنساء والعجزة أعلم أنكم جميعا أو جلكم تشاطرون الشعور بالغضب عن عجز المجتمع الدولي ومؤسساته عن وقف آلة الغثل والدمار وعن تحقيق وحفظ الأمن والسلام وعن محاسبة ومعاقبة المسؤولين عن الإبادة الجماعية في غزة وبغية الأراضي وقد أدى فقد عجز المنظومة الدولية عن القيام بمهامة في حفظ السلام التي إلى فقد الثقة في المجتمع الدولي وإلى مزيد من الفرغة الأخوة والأخوات ترون اليوم وكل يوم كيف يتحول البشر إلى كواسر ضاربة لا يحكمها قانون ولا يردعها وازع ديني أو أخلاقي إن أسباب الإرهاب 
والعدوان وغياب الاستقرار والسلام تشمل غياب العدالة والحوار والتسامح إننا كبرلمانيين يمثلون شعوبهم أمامنا جبال من المصاعب والعقبات التي يجب تجاوزها من خلال الوحدة والتعاون والحوار والنغاش نحن نمتلك أدوات التغيير والعمل مع حكوماتنا من أجل وقف الحروب والنزاعات الداخلية والحروب بين الدول كما يمكننا كبرلمانات التصدي للتغيرات غير الدستورية والتي تهدد السيادة في الدول الديمقراطية وندعو الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي أن يقوم بدور فاعل في وجه تفويض الأنظمة الديمقراطية عبر الانغلابات العسكرية ويمكن للبرلمانيين كذلك ضمان تنفيذ الحكومات للمعاهدات والاتفاقات الدولية ذات الصلة بتحقيق التنمية المستدامة ويجب على برلماناتنا أن تصبح قوة قوة تمثيل حقيقي من خلال تطبيق الشفافية والمساءلة شكرا لك Thank you, Qatar. We welcome to the podium, Romania. Madam President, distinguished colleagues, the focus of this IPU session on peace and security is most timely. Given the multiple crises and the many conflicts around the globe, which require enhanced parliamentary input to facilitate cooperation and long-lasting solutions. The Parliament of Romania has always been a strong supporter of inter-parliamentary cooperation at regional, bilateral and multilateral levels. Over 100 parliamentary groups contribute to enhancing Romania's ties with countries from all around the world. We joined the IPU in 1891, just two years after the creation of our organization. We participate in the OSCE, NATO, the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assemblies, and the Parliamentary Assemblies of Francophonie, and in various cooperation formats in our region. And in few months from now, Romania will host a major parliamentary diplomacy event, the 31st annual session of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, gathering together hundreds of parliamentarians from more than 50 countries across three continents to address the most pressing issues facing the transatlantic community. Dear colleagues, through parliamentary diplomacy, parliaments can open or maintain channels of dialogue, support political dialogue and mediation, and foster mutual understanding among countries. At the same time, parliamentary diplomacy is a unique capacity building tool. It provides Parliament with the means to scrutinize foreign policy and the implementation of international agreements effectively. It helps parliaments to perform better, to be more transparent and open, and to give a stronger voice to the people that they represent. And by doing so, parliamentary diplomacy enhances the conflict prevention function of parliaments. Dear friends, the best way for parliaments to promote peace and security is by averting threats of conflict before they occur. This being said, we must recognize that today multiple crises and conflicts continue to lead the parliamentary diplomacy initiatives and formats that are necessary, but we didn't wish for, including the task force created by the IPU following the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Unfortunately, parliaments throughout the world continue to dedicate valuable time and resources to address conflicts instead of harnessing parliamentary diplomacy to its full extent in order to advance 
sustainable development all over the world. Finally, let me stress that parliamentary diplomacy is never conducted in isolation. Our actions in this field, no matter how innovative, refined or diversified, will benefit the people we represent only if they are based on good governance and the full respect of the principles and values underpinning democracy, human rights and the rule of law. The Parliament of Romania is committed to working together with parliaments around the world to uphold these principles and values, which are the building blocks for achieving lasting peace. Thank you. Thank you, Romania. We welcome to the podium Germany. Madam Chair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, fellow parliamentarians, peace is more than the absence of armed conflicts. It encompassed security, the rule of law, and the conditions necessary for individuals, families, and communities to lead fulfilling lives and realize their socioeconomic potential. This is the first sentence of our concept notes for this debate, and I think it is a really wise sentence. Actually, by the way, it is just another description of SDG 16, our topic in Luanda, and today's debate is more or less a continuation of our discussions in Angola Prosperity can only develop in a safe and stable environment. Therefore, we have to tackle conflicts and terror and provide security. Otherwise, no one can plant crops or conduct trades. Prosperity can only develop with reliability and trust. Otherwise, economic perspectives will not develop. To fight poverty will not be possible. In the Committee on Sustainable Development yesterday, we consented a preambular paragraph 18, and I quote, every nation is responsible for creating an attractive investment climate that can draw in both domestic and international capital to speed up. And yes, huge investments are necessary for jobs, for the environment, to replace fossil fuels by wind, solar, or hydrogen. Huge investments are necessary. And that will, that will happen only if there is a legal framework which is reliable and regarded stable permanently for years to come. No one should advise others how exactly such a framework should be developed, but it must be reliable. And by talking about experience, sharing experiences, this is already a contribution to parliamentary diplomacy, and we should make use of it. But of course, most important precondition for better life is the absence of armed conflicts. And st instead, that exactly is what people had to experience in 56 countries in 2023, experienced and suffered those armed conflicts. There are conflicts which are in the international news. Russian, Russia's war against the Ukraine brought enormous suffering to people in the Ukraine and to thousands of families in Russia too. Putin could stop this war within one day. In Gaza, we effectively had a stable ceasefire 
until October 7 last year. Thousands of Palestinians had jobs in Israel. But this stable ceasefire was terminated by Hamas terror, terror against civilians in Israel. And we did hear impressive reports on this just a couple of minutes ago. The ongoing destruction of Hamas terror infrastructure again causes huge suffering. And we cannot accept this. This war must end. We desperately need sustainable peace in Gaza, Israel, and beyond. And I think there are many more conflicts which are under the radar, but it doesn't matter for people whether they are in the news or not. Being victim of such events occurs to people on grassroots level in many conflicts. And we, in, as parliamentarians, are in a unique position. We know the grassroots level. We are part of it, and at the same time, we are part of an international network. IPU is a strong pillar of this, and we have a lot of bilateral friendship groups in our parliaments. So it's up to us to bridge gaps, to find compromises, and to work on sustainable peace, and to fill the word parliamentarian democracy with life. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Germany. We now welcome to the podium, Brazil. Senhoras e senhores, é louvável que esta Assembleia temos como tema de debate geral a construção de pontes para a paz e a compreensão. Nas pessoas da presidente da União Interparlamentar, Tulia Axon, e do secretário deste organismo, Martin Chun Kong, cumprimento todos os membros que participam da iniciativa de trazer para essa instância uma discussão tão premente necessária. Causa tristeza profunda a constatação de que, em pleno ano de 2024, quase 60 países estejam envolvidos em conflitos armados. Esse quadro revela que há muito por fazer para que as populações possam viver com dignidade, liberdade e segurança. Enquanto houver guerras, haverá vidas inocentes sendo perdidas, haverá crianças sem acesso à saúde e à educação, haverá famílias sem um aporte adequado de alimentos em suas mesas, haverá miséria e desigualdade social, haverá, portanto, violação a direitos humanos básicos. O inverso também ocorre, onde impera a injustiça e a desigualdade social, surgem os gatilhos que disparam armas. O Brasil é, historicamente, uma nação promotora da paz e da diplomacia. A defesa da paz, a solução pacífica de conflitos e o repúdio ao terrorismo e ao racismo são princípios norteadores das nossas relações internacionais, conforme estabelecido na nossa Constituição Federal. E o Parlamento brasileiro não tem se furtado a missão institucional que lhe cabe, posicionando acerca de diversas situações em que nos bramos ameaça os direitos e liberdades de populações envolvidas em conflitos. Com os instrumentos de que dispomos, como moções e tratativas que se dão por meio dos grupos parlamentares de amizade com nações estrangeiras, temos nos manifestado contra ataques violentos em defesa de nações injustamente invadidas e em favor do acolhimento e da solidariedade para com vítimas de guerras e refugiados. Os parlamentos especialmente os que defendem a democracia, têm o dever de cobrar respeito às leis e princípios fundamentais das nações e povos contidas na Carta das Nações Unidas. Aliás, o fortalecimento dos organismos internacionais é um tema que deveria ser mais discutido no âmbito dos parlamentos nacionais. O Brasil tem expressado seu interesse em reformar o sistema de governança global, de modo a dar mais legitimidade e força para que as decisões tomadas em colegiados internacionais, como o Conselho de Segurança e a Organização Mundial do Comércio. Senhoras e senhores, o custo humanitário de uma guerra é terrível e seus efeitos têm duração que se prolonga para além dos nossos horizontes. Não é possível ter paz, por exemplo, onde ainda persista a fome, e é nesse contexto que os países que se destacam na produção de alimentos assumem responsabilidade inarredável. A suspensão de barreiras comerciais, 
e a disseminação de políticas públicas de segurança alimentar para populações em situação de vulnerabilidade, são medidas em que a atuação dos parlamentos é decisiva para a promoção da paz. Temos de fazer com que as legislações eficazes no esforço de combate à fome, que se somam, obviamente, a atos do governo, sejam conhecidas e replicadas onde for possível. Esse é um esforço que a diplomacia parlamentar brasileira tem abraçado, com, é, contando com o apoio das Nações Amigas. Na estrutura institucional das Câmaras dos Deputados no Brasil, temos a Secretaria de Relações Internacionais, que atua no estabelecimento e estreitamento das nossas conexões com outros parlamentos. Acreditamos na força e na importância da diplomacia parlamentar para espraiar boas práticas mundo afora e contribuir, assim, para a construção e fortalecimento de relações mais democráticas dentro das fronteiras de cada país e mais amistosas, pacíficas e solidárias no âmbito externo. O Congresso Nacional do Brasil tem o um condão de projetar os interesses nacionais no exterior, promover intercâmbios nacionais no interior e criar novos canais de diálogo. Temos trabalhado para que esse papel seja cada vez mais reconhecido e valorizado. E acreditamos cada vez mais que essa via mais certeira e justa para oferecer nossos préstimos para uma cessação da violência e resolução pacífica dos conflitos, com respeito à determinação e à integridade territorial dos Estados. Como bem disse a doutora Zilda Arnes, médica brasileira indicada ao Prêmio Nobel da Paz, a paz começa dentro de cada pessoa e é transmitida aos outros. Seja nessa Assembleia, seja nos nossos parlamentos nacionais, seja nas nossas bases eleitorais, nosso papel é propugnar pelo bem comum. E esse bem é indissociável da harmonia e do entendimento entre grupos populacionais e países. Precisamos fazer com que a paz brote em nós, para que possamos semeá-la em toda parte. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Brazil. We now welcome the United Kingdom to the podium. Thank you very much, Madam President. Fellow parliamentarians, the topic of our debate is building bridges. And building bridges is what we do as parliamentarians. It's our bread and butter. It's what we spend our time doing day in, day out, be it on our committees, be it when we're legislating, be it working with ministers. We have to work together. We have to find ways to, to find compromise and we have to find ways to build bridges. And when we do, we achieve so much more than if we stand alone, isolated. Successful leaders know compromise is essential. We all know that getting something, even a little bit of something good, is much better than getting nothing of the perfect. We say in English, do not let the, do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And too often, this is the problem. We stand here as parliamentarians, as leaders, and we want the perfect. And we simply cannot have that. We have to build bridges. And the public understand this. I want to give you two examples in my own parliament of where building bridges failed and where building bridges was a success. The, end, the example of it not working well was when the United Kingdom decided to leave the European Union. Now, I pass no judgment on that decision. It was a decision taken by the people of the United Kingdom in a referendum. But it was Parliament's job to deliver on that decision. And simply, we just didn't do that for far too long. Parliamentarians who wanted to stay in the European Union and have a second referendum joined forces with parliamentarians who wanted to leave the European Union with no deal whatsoever. They couldn't both get what they wanted, but they let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And it resulted in stasis, it resulted in the public treating us with the most incredible disdain, and it resulted in many good friends losing their seats at a general election. But we can see, see examples where it works. And I cite the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which was signed 26 years ago. This was an example of where politicians were prepared to work together and make compromises. They were prepared to build bridges. And the IPU has played a very significant role in that process.
because it was the IPU, the British group of the Interparliamentary Union, and the Irish group that formed a friendship group known to the British Irish Parliamentary Board way, way before the Good Friday Agreement. It was those parliamentarians working together, realising that we have so much more in common than that divides us, that laid the groundwork for those leaders to make the difficult decision and to make the compromises that were necessary to achieve peace. So I say to you parliamentarians, fellow parliamentarians, if everyone could move away from the ideal just a little bit, we will achieve so much more. Absolutism and populism are the enemies of this. Describing to people that they can have everything they want and you can deliver everything they want is simply not feasible. And it ends up with the public thinking that we are not worthy to have, hold the position of elected parliamentarians. The alternative to working together is chaos. There are malign influences in the world who don't believe in the world order. They don't believe in the rule of law. They believe that there should be chaos. And they are the malign influences that are stopping us making the right decisions and the right compromises that are needed in this very, very challenging world. So this is a choice for all of us. Are we going to work together and do the job for which we were elected? Or are we going to watch the world descend into chaos and the end of democracy? Frankly, parliamentarians, it's up to us. Thank you. Thank you to the United Kingdom. Our next speaker is New Zealand. And as New Zealand comes to the podium, I would like to introduce the next chair of this assembly, Ms. Anna Brunkovic, who is the speaker of the National Assembly of Serbia. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Well, good afternoon, uh, parliamentarians. And my name is Stuart Smith, and I'm the Member of Parliament for Kaikoura, which is in the top of the South Island of New Zealand. Parliamentarians across the world have the power to make a real impact. By strengthening regional security, raising awareness of international obligations, scrutinising legislation, and condemning violations of international law, we can foster a culture of peace and security. New Zealand holds a distinctive position as a significant regional influencer in the Pacific with a robust democracy. Our commitment to building bridges for peace is deeply ingrained in our national identity. This is further underscored by our active participation in multilateral treaties aimed at promoting peaceful conflict resolution. Our dedication to nuclear disarmament is exemplified by our membership of various disarmament treaties and agreements. The passing of legislation such as the New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament Act of 1987 reflects our st stance against nuclear proliferation. Moreover, our parliamentary system provides a platform for cross-party collaboration, enabling us to actively engage in international security efforts. As a dialogue partner with the regional organisations like ASEAN and the Pacific Islands Forum, we have a unique opportunity to foster cooperation and stability in the Pacific region, tackling emerging challenges with innovation and integrity. New Zealand's reputation as the honest broker in regional security peacekeeping is testament to our values of fairness and honesty. Our contribution to over 40 UN peacekeeping operations signify our enduring commitment to global peace and security. Furthermore, our interparliamentary friendship groups strengthen diplomatic ties and promote parliamentary democracy. Through direct engagement with legislators from other countries, these groups enhance mutual understanding and collaboration on regional and global challenges. In today's world, cooperation among parliamentarians and with international bodies like the United Nations 
is paramount. The ultimate implementers of treaties and legislation, parliaments play a pivotal role in shaping global peace and culture. We should continue to leverage initiatives at, that uphold the principles of democracy and cooperation on the global stage. Let us embrace collaboration, exchange experiences, and work towards a safer and more peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to invite Bahamas and then Austria. Thank you. Madam President, our GRULAC and CARICOM colleagues, other distinguished colleagues, we meet today with the knowledge that peace is paramount if we are to make meaningful global progress on the Sustainable Development Goals. We have all seen how the effects of conflict spread like a plague, requiring all nations to come together in the name of world peace. I applaud the IPU Task Force on the peaceful resolution of the war in Ukraine for its effort to foster dialogue between parliamentarians in Ukraine and the Russian Federation. I also note the shared concerns about the ongoing conflict in Israel and the Gaza Strip, as we condemn the acts of terrorism conducted by Hamas, as well as any actions on both sides that infringe upon basic human rights and violate international humanitarian law. As we focus on these conflicts, I ask you to draw your eyes to the West, where conflict is growing with direct repercussions for Gulag states. In South America, we have brewing tensions between Guyana and Venezuela over the declaration of the Essequibo state as Venezuelan territory. There's an urgent need for dialogue and mediation to prevent further escalation of this very critical situation. I join the sentiments of my colleague from the Dominican Republic. In the Caribbean, there are the ongoing atrocities happening in the Republic of Haiti. Thousands of killings and sexual assaults, as well as widespread poverty and hunger. What we are seeing unfold is a crisis of human suffering. This humanitarian crisis has created an ensuing migrant crisis, which my small nation, as well as other surrounding nations, must now face with little to no support. The Prime Minister of the Bahamas, the Honorable Philip Davis, has worked closely with the wider Caribbean community to explore potential solutions. Our efforts have included the establishment of the Eminent Persons Group, comprised of three past Caribbean heads of state, including, including former Prime Minister of the Bahamas, the Honorable Perry Christie, to hold meetings with stakeholders in an effort to develop a Haiti-led solution to this conflict. There is also the Haitian Multinational Security Support Mission, which the Bahamas has been one of a few Caribbean nations to publicly commit to supporting through training, capacity building, and joint planning exercises with the Haitian National Police. However, the scale of the problem is far greater than the Bahamas, or even a group of Caribbean nations can manage on our own as small island developing states. According to UN estimates, 5.5 million Haitian people are in need of assistance. That is over 10 times larger than my country's total population. 45% of Haiti's 11 million people lack access to clean water. And there is an estimated 674 million US dollars needed for immediate support, but only 6% of that goal has been met. The lack of focused global efforts to address the plight of the Haitian people is a travesty. So today, I am inviting fellow parliamentarians 
to support the advancement of global peace in all regions. As parliamentarians, I believe we are equally positioned to advocate for global action on the world stage and by mobilizing resources within our home countries. The IPU also has the ability to make a difference through its ability to influence discussions and inspire and coordinate action. This organization has never shied away from taking on the big issues like climate change, gender equality, and of course, peace and security issues like we've seen with Russia and Ukraine. I encourage this assembly to continue to push for world peace in all member parliaments, including among the Gulag states, with special consideration of the growing tensions between Guyana and Venezuela and the ongoing conflict and suffering in the Republic of Haiti. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to now invite Austria and then Lithuania. Honorable Chair and Speaker of Serbia, uh, dear colleagues and friends, the current state of international peace and security is alarming. In an era of marked by increasing polarization, widespread conflict and global crisis, our commitment to parliamentary diplomacy is more critical than ever. For me, therefore, it is a disappointment that for the second time we were not able to discuss the situation in Gaza collectively within our framework. The terrorist attack on 7th October 2023 by Hamas-led militants and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza should have been in the center of our emergency item discussion. Let me remind you, in the past, we were able to manage it. We discussed other emergency items like the war in Ukraine uh, in the assembly in Kigali or the serious humanitarian crisis affecting the people in Afghanistan, the Syrian Arab Republic, Ukraine, Yemen, and other countries in Manama. We have to overstep our feelings and sometimes frustration and disappointment Though they are justified, our focus must now be on learning our lessons, maintaining respectful dialogue, and identifying common ground. And I am still optimistic that we can manage it to discuss all these important issues the next IPU assembly in autumn that we are able to come back to find a common ground to discuss an emergency item. Dear colleagues, beside the fight of Israel against the Hamas terrorists and the war in Ukraine, both were mentioned very often, we should have further emerging, uh, emerging threats in our focus. Threats including cyber and hybrid crisis, terrorism, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Additionally, climate change, geopolitical instabilities, and threats to our democratic values. Disinformation and the misuse of artificial intelligence are further issues which complicate the situation and the global stability. In the face of these challenges, parliamentary diplomacy represents a unique and vital tool in our collective efforts to foster global peace and mutual understanding. It goes beyond traditional diplomacy by bringing together the voices of the people represented through us, through elected officials, to engage directly in the international arena. This people-centric approach ensures that pursuit of peace and understanding 
is not just a top-down endeavor, but a shared responsibility that reflects the will and aspiration of the global community. We see the founding year of Interparliamentary Union, 1889, as the birth year of parliamentary diplomacy. Since that time, parliamentarians came together and year by year, parliaments and our foreign policy activities have increased significantly. Parliamentary diplomacy has become important and also when we look at UN, more and more UN is involving parliamentarians in its work. And with the Interparliamentary Union as historical pioneer, the Austrian parliament always was committed to support this work. We were the first national parliament to co-host the World Conference of Speakers of Parliaments in Vienna in 2021. And we try, therefore, to be a one big supporter of all these interparliamentary activities. And as my colleagues from New Zealand and Bahamas mentioned before, let us work together for a peaceful and safer world. It is our duty to do this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite Lithuania, followed by Hungary, and then China. But Lithuania has the floor. Thank you. Madam President, Speakers of Parliament, colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here today with you. Peace is at the heart of both our societies and the international community. Meanwhile, understanding is central to peace. These are the two major conditions for the future of every state. As democratically elected parliament parliamentarians, we have to take responsibility and act. Not only must we be concerned about the internal stability of our countries and the peaceful coexistence of all groups of society, but we must also become defenders of the principles of international law. We have a number of instruments that we could use to end this. First of all, we must not remain indifferent. We must not remain on the sidelines. We must underscore the critical importance of, the, of a unified international response to uphold the principles of the UN Charter and defend the integrity of the rules-based order. Our support for the sovereignty of each country must be unwearing, and our support for a country defending its sovereign international recognized territory should go without saying. At the same time, we must realize that no conflict, whatever it takes place ge geographically, is far away from us, as we all feel the conse consequences of every conflict. Lithuania is an European country and only 400 kilometers away from Ukraine and Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine. We can see the consequences of its brutal war in, in the eyes of every Ukrainian war refugee we meet in Lithuania. You are feeling the consequences of this war too. Russia's hindering of Ukraine's export through the Black Sea ports puts pressure on the vulnerable across the globe. This is, disrupts people's life and increases migration flows. Today, Ukraine is not only fighting for its own country. Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine is a manifest violation of the UN charters, which poses an acute challenge of global peace and security. As we do not remain indifferent to those who suffer, we must also take absolute action against the aggressor. International isolation must be enforced first and foremost. The aggressor cannot be allowed to participate in international forums on an equal footing, nor have the privilege of exercising the right of veto. Parliamentary diplomacy may not be the most powerful weapon in this context, 
but it can be really effective and impactful if we all work together. Most parliaments have a tradition of creating parliamentary friendship groups with other parliaments. Parliamentary friendship groups are the simplest means of establishing parliamentary context and decreasing understanding. The next step is cooperation in specific areas. All parliaments have committees and commissions responsible for specific areas. Cooperation at this level creates added value by, by enabling the sharing of experience and ideas. Development cooperation adds similar values, not only in terms of increasing understanding, but also in terms of bringing about improvement. All of these measures show that we have the tools to communicate and decrease the understanding leading to peace. All we need is the will and effort that we as parliamentarians can demonstrate. Achu. Thank you very much. I would, I would like to invite now uh, Hungary and then China and after China, Cyprus. Madam President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the face-to-face -face parliamentary meetings or events as a personal contact are able to build bridges and give possibilities to deeper understanding of our negoti negotiating partners' interests and perspectives and the different opinions might govern each other. Hungary believes that armed conflicts around the world must be solved only through negotiation and that the parliamentary diplomacy may also be an important tool to maintain sustainable peace. We have to believe in it uh, in order we can reach consensus and realize lasting peace instead of continuous arms uh, race which may result in further expansion of armed conflicts on our continents. The special bodies of the IPU are the best examples of parliamentary diplomacy as the main goal of their work is to bring the parties concerned the, to the negotiating table and find solution to the problems. Fellow parliament, parliamentarians, this year marks the 137th anniversary of the foundation of the Interparliamentary Union. Hungary, as a one of the nine founding members of the IPU, has been playing a important role in its long-lasting history. The Hungarian Parliament hosted three times IPU assemblies. Nowadays, all members of the Hungarian National Assembly are also members of the Hungarian National Group of the IPU. The main tasks of the uh, national IPU group are in the domestic context to assist the work of the bilateral and multilateral friendship groups established by MPs within the framework of the National Assembly and in terms of the international relations of the National Assemblies to participate in its international activity. The activity of the friendship groups uh, is an integral part of the bilateral parliamentary di diplomacy and therefore it's essential to the maintenance the foreign relations of the National Assembly. In the present parliamentary term, there are 93 French groups in the Hungarian parliament with about 130 MPs taking active part in their work. Dear colleagues, let me underline the importance of the rule IPU plays in the national context. The IPU is a special forum of the parliamentary diplomacy through which MPs can inform other nations' delegates, both in the oral or writing form uh, of the political, economic, and social processes occurring in the, their home countries. Ladies and gentlemen, peace is our most prestigious position. It allows uh, us to build resilient exclusive societies 
that the rights of the most vulnerable and uh, minorities are respected and it can foster to sustainable development and strengthening of democracy institutions. The IPU was created to uh, preserve peace and we believe that all its members parliaments must contribute to the achievement of this goal. We have been believing in IPU crucial role of the fostering parliamentary diplomacy from its creation will till nowadays and shall do our utmost in order to serve its aims. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and I would like to invite His Excellency Mr. Xiao from China.主席女士、各位同事、很高兴出席一连第48届大会。中方对俄罗斯发生严重恐怖袭击事件造成重大人员伤亡深感震惊。对遇难者表示深切哀悼，对伤者和遇难者家属表示诚挚慰问。中方反
，促进人文交流。主席女士、各位同事，中国共产党带领中国人民正坚定不移沿着中国式现代化道路稳步前行，中国经济始终充满活力与韧性，长期向好的势头更加明显。中国的快速发展。将为世界释放更多利好。中国愿做促进全球增长的稳定力量，同各方一道，携手构建人类命运共同体。谢谢大家。Thank you very much, and I would like to now invite Cyprus, and then Burkina Faso. Madam President and dear colleagues, parliaments hold a key role in sustaining peace at national, regional, and international levels by leveraging its unique assets compared to traditional diplomacy to serve our common goals. In light of an unprecedented challenges by the ongoing war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza, parliaments must play a more robust role in international relations. As they are not bound by the formal negotiating mandates, parliamentarians can play an important role in conveying political messages and establishing communication channels. A strong and effective international legal framework with the United Nations at its center is necessary for preserving global peace and security. The input that parliaments can provide to global deliberations and United Nations processes is very, is very essential towards inclusive decision-making that reflects the concerns and the best interests of all citizens. Dear colleagues, there is no doubt that violations of international law constitute the heaviest blow to our joint efforts to safeguard peace and security in our universe. Even more alarming is the logic of double standards demonstrated by the international community. Should such a logic not prevail and Turkey were to be held accountable for its illegal invasion and continuing occupation of over one-third of Cyprus territory, the Cyprus problem would not have persisted for over half a century. Instead, Turkey's claim for a, sta a two-state solution coupled with its escalating provocations and illegal actions on the ground and within Cyprus' exclusive economic zone point Turkey's total disregard of international law being tolerated. We, the Greek Cypriot community, will do our best for a just and a viable settlement of the Cyprus problem on the basis of bizonal by communal federation that will reunify our country in conditions of lasting peace and security to the benefit of the whole people of Cyprus, Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, Turkey himself, and the wider region. Madam President, dear colleagues, thank you very much 
for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, representative of Burkina Faso, and then followed by Gambia, and then Angola. So now Burkina Faso. Excellence, Madame la Présidente de l'UIP, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général de l'UIP, chers collègues parlementaires, Mesdames et Messieurs, à l'entame de mon propos, permettez-moi de remercier Madame la Présidente de l'UIP et Monsieur le Secrétaire Général pour l'organisation réussie de la présente Assemblée générale. Madame la Présidente, recevez par ma voix les sincères salutations de Son Excellence, Dr Ousmane Bougma, président de l'Assemblée législative de transition du Burkina Faso. Honorables parlementaires, Mesdames et Messieurs, le thème de notre présente session, diplomatie parlementaire, tisser des relations pour promouvoir la paix et la compréhension, nous offre l'opportunité d'échanger sur le rôle combien important que les parlementaires peuvent jouer ou dirais-je, doivent jouer dans la promotion de la paix et de la sécurité internationale. Le Burkina Faso, jadis connu comme un modèle de paix et de coexistence pacifique, est aujourd'hui confronté à des attaques terroristes, lâches et barbares qui endeuillent nos paisibles populations. En effet, mon pays, le Burkina Faso, et ses voisins de la bande sahélienne, que sont le Mali et le Niger, font douloureusement face à une guerre sous forme d'attaques terroristes qui font des milliers de victimes civiles et militaires et ont engendré une situation humanitaire préoccupante. C'est pourquoi le Burkina Faso apprécie la pertinence du thème de cette présente session et espère voir la diplomatie jouer pleinement son rôle dans la résolution de conflits au Sahel. Car la stabilité et la paix dans cet espace géographique est essentielle pour toute la région, pour l'Afrique et pour le monde entier. Chers collègues, Mesdames et Messieurs, la paix, le dit-on souvent, est le fruit des efforts des hommes. Il est aussi indiscutable que c'est dans l'esprit des hommes que naissent les guerres et c'est dans l'esprit des hommes que sont logés les germes de la paix. Si cet adage populaire nous indique à suffisance que l'on peut facilement mettre un terme aux guerres conventionnelles, la guerre imposée au Burkina Faso, au Mali et au Niger relève d'une autre réalité. Cependant, avec les moyens technologiques dont disposent certaines grandes puissances occidentales et au regard de la célérité avec laquelle ces puissances ont pu localiser les acteurs d'actes terroristes sur leur territoire, et en dehors de leur pays, nous démontre qu'il est suffisamment d'un engagement sincère à soutenir nos pays pour en finir avec les groupes terroristes. La contribution de la diplomatie parlementaire pourrait résider à l'échange des bonnes pratiques en matière de promotion de la paix, à la mutualisation des pratiques et des moyens et à un plaidoyer en faveur des pays du Sahel en proie au terrorisme. C'est pourquoi 
J'en appelle à une solidarité internationale agissante envers les pays de l'Alliance des États du Sahel. Il me plaît de renouveler notre engagement en la diplomatie parlementaire, car nous avons foi en sa capacité de promotion de la paix et de la compréhension mutuelle dans le monde, si nous travaillons ensemble, main dans la main. Chers collègues, mesdames et messieurs, je conclue mes propos en partageant avec vous cette opinion. Il n'y aura point de paix dans le monde si, à quelque part, un pays fut-il le moins puissant et le plus petit n'est pas en paix. Vive la diplomatie parlementaire, vive l'UIP, je vous remercie. Thank you very much. And now Gambia takes the floor, please. Madam President, the theme for this session is timely and pertinent. In a world troubled with strife, division, and uncertainty, parliamentary diplomacy emerges as a beacon of hope for fostering peace, dialogue, and mutual understanding. Now more than ever, we are summoned to transcend our differences, bridge divides, and chart a course towards a more harmonious and an interconnected global community. At the heart of parliamentary diplomacy lies the recognition that dialogue, cooperation, and meaningful engagement is an indispensable tool for resolving conflicts, promoting reconciliation, and advancing the shared interests of humanity. As parliamentarians, we bear a solemn responsibility to uphold the fundamental principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law tirelessly working towards the collective well-being of our citizens and the broader international community. Today, we are reminded of the pivotal role of the parliamentary diplomacy and democracy plays in addressing the pressing challenges confronting our world. Chronic conflicts in Africa, spanning nations like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Somalia, and the Central African Republic, continue to inflict profound suffering upon communities, disrupt livelihoods, and exacerbate humanitarian crises. Moreover, the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine serves as a stark reminder of the fragility of peace in Europe and its far-reaching implications for individuals and nations far and near in the conflict zone. The impact of these conflicts extend far beyond the immediate victims affecting the lives of people worldwide. As conflicts persist, the global cost of living escalates, rendering necessities increasingly unaffordable for millions. Food insecurity, human displacement, and economic stability are just a few of the dire consequences faced by individuals and communities tangled in the crossfire of conflicts. Madam President, the enduring Israel-Palestinian conflict underscores the urgent need for concerted efforts towards peace and reconciliation. The government and people of the Gambia, under the leadership of His Excellency President Adam Abaro, stands in solidarity with the international community in condemning all forms of violence and aggression, particularly the recent Israeli military operations in Gaza. These operations have resulted in the loss of innocent lives, widespread destruction to properties, and profound humanitarian suffering. We echo the call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and, and across Palestine to prevent further bloodshed 
and alleviate the dire humanitarian situation facing the Palestinian people. It is imperative to acknowledge that the root causes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are entrenched in decades of forceful occupation, displacement, and denial of basic fundamental rights to the Palestinian people. The government of the Gambia reaffirms its commitment to upholding international law, human rights, and the United Nations General Assembly resolutions as the foundation for any meaningful and lasting resolution to this enduring conflict. My delegation and I call on the United Nations Security Council to act positively and pass a unified resolution to condemn Israel and end the war. In this vein, we emphasize the importance of accountability and justice for all parties responsible for violence of international law and human rights. The government of the Gambia calls for thorough and impartial investigations into alleged atrocities committed during the recent military operations in Gaza, with a view to holding perpetrators accountable and ensuring justice for the victims. Furthermore, we reiterate our unwavering support for the legitimate aspiration of the Palestinian people to establish an, an independent and sovereign state of Palestine, with East Jerusalem referred to in Arabic as Al-Quds Al-Sarif as its capital, based on the pre-1967 borders. We urge the international community to redouble its effort to facilitate a comprehensive and inclusive peace process that addresses the root causes of the conflict with a view of ensuring a just and durable so solution. As the world's largest gathering of parliamentarians, we bear a profound responsibility to advocate for dialogue, reconciliation, and respect for fundamental human rights of the people of all nations across the globe. The recently submission of the Gambia to the International Court of Justice serves as a powerful testament to her commitment as a nation to upholding international law and promoting peace and justice. In this submission, the Gambia emphasized to the ICJ that Israel's occupation of Palestine is illegal and must be ended immediately. This underscores the importance of addressing ongoing conflicts through international legal channels and collective action through parliamentary diplomacy and collective engagement as manifested in the very core principles of IPU, we can build bridges that foster understanding, tolerance, and cooperation among others. In Thank conclusion, you. Madam President, Thank you. The, you may all agree that since the formation of the IPU in 1889, parliamentary diplomacy has proven to be a powerful tool for resolving conflict and promoting dialogue. For example, in 1994 and 1988, the Parliament of South Africa and that of uh, Northern Ireland have engaged parliamentary diplomacy and successfully ended what was in their countries. In conclusion, let us reaffirm our unflinching commitment to the principles of peace, justice, and equality for all peoples and nations. Together, let us endeavor towards a future where the aspiration of the Palestinian people for freedom, dignity, and self-determination are realized, and where all parties are held accountable for their actions under international law. I thank you all. Thank you very much. I'm Andrew of the time. The next is Angola. Thank you. <risos> Excelências, Presidente da UIP, caros colegas, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, permitam-me em primeiro lugar, Senhora Presidente Túlia Jackson, que por vosso intermédio agradeçamos a todas as delegações que se designaram, dignaram em estar presentes em Luanda, Angola, a quando da 147ª Assembleia da UIP. O vosso apoio, direto e indireto, foi crucial para que conseguíssemos realizar uma Assembleia exitosa em Luanda. Estamos-vos, pois, gratos por nos terem honrado com a vossa presença e reiteramos o nosso agradecimento especial ao apoio técnico prestado pelo Secretariado da UIP. É com grande honra que nos dirigimos a vós, a partir desta tribuna, para abordar um tema de vital importância nos dias de hoje. 
Vivemos um período de intensa instabilidade do sistema internacional, com guerras, desafios macroeconómicos, polarização política, desigualdades económicas e sociais, cibersegurança e alterações climáticas, que diariamente põem em perigo a compreensão entre os povos e, consequentemente, a paz. Senhora Presidente, Excelências, Minhas Senhoras, Meus Senhores, a diplomacia parlamentar, foco deste debate geral, é atualmente encarada num mundo marcado por divisões e conflitos como uma luz de esperança e um caminho para a paz e a compreensão mútua. Esta tem uma, um papel importante para construir pontes entre nações e culturas e promover o diálogo e a cooperação em oposição aos conflitos e às hostilidades e apraz-me poder partilhar este espaço em que os diferentes pontos de vista são acolhidos e respeitados. É nosso entendimento que, enquanto legisladores, nós temos a responsabilidade de cultivar as relações de entendimento e a busca do equilíbrio para a promoção da paz e da segurança internacionais, materializando deste modo um dos objetivos preconizados na Carta da Organização das Nações Unidas. Excelências, a nossa capacidade de estabelecer um diálogo construtivo com parlamentares de outras nações é, pois, essencial para superar diferenças e encontrar soluções pacíficas para os desafios globais com que confrontam a humanidade. É manifestamente evidente que nenhum Estado é suficientemente poderoso para lidar de modo unilateral com tais desafios, dentre os quais o terrorismo internacional, a preservação ambiental, o comércio internacional e as grandes endemias. Por esta razão, o nosso compromisso com a diplomacia parlamentar deve ser inquebrantável por fortalecer as relações internacionais e fomentar a confiança necessária para a resolução dos conflitos do nosso tempo. Como representantes eleitos do povo, a nossa responsabilidade é também a de buscar soluções pacíficas para os desafios globais, ao invés de tratarmos apenas do interesse nacional dos nossos Estados. Temos, por isso, a obrigação moral de lado a lado trabalhar em prol de um mundo pacífico, tolerante e, sobretudo, mais justo e harmonioso. Com efeito, importa reconhecer que a África ainda continua a ser palco de conflitos, o que mina de modo significativo a realização das necessidades dos seus povos e condiciona o alcance dos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. É neste sentido justo destacar que o engajamento de Sua Excelência Presidente da República de Angola, João Manuel Gonçalves Lourenço, na busca de formas de governação cada vez mais participativas e inclusivas, que contribuem para a divulgação de uma cultura nacional de paz, assim como a pacificação no continente, sobretudo no âmbito da Conferência Internacional sobre a Região dos Grandes Lagos. Saliente-se que, por esta razão, a União Africana atribuiu ao Presidente João Lourenço o título de campeão da, para a paz e reconciliação em África. Excelências, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, Façamos, pois, um pacto no sentido de juntos trabalharmos no fortalecimento das instituições democráticas, no combate à corrupção, na promoção da igualdade de género e na proteção dos direitos humanos e dos povos. Seguindo o espírito Ubuntu, temos de tudo fazer para tratar dignamente o nosso próximo, enquanto o nosso semelhante somos todos seres de uma mesma família humana e que nenhum povo se sinta, por isso, mais privilegiado do que o outro ou com mais direitos do que o outro. Significa que a filosofia Ubuntu deve sempre premiar os nossos esforços no domínio da diplomacia parlamentar com a finalidade de construir um futuro mais promissor para todos. Que este debate seja, efetivamente, um passo significativo para fortalecer a diplomacia parlamentar e para construir um mundo mais pacífico, justo e solidário para as gerações vindouras. Muito obrigada a todos os presentes. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would now like to invite the representatives of Equatorial Guinea to take the floor.
And again, just be mindful of, of the time, please. Thank you. Señora Presidenta, eh, distinguidos delegados, la 148 Asamblea de la Unión Interparlamentaria objeto de este encuentro constituye una nueva oportunidad para todas las delegaciones asistentes de compartir experiencias e importantes reflexiones en torno al tema objeto de debate general bajo el título Diplomacia Parlamentaria, tender puentes para promover la paz y el entendimiento. Es en este sentido ruego, en nombre y representación del Parlamento de la República de Guinea Ecuatorial, me sea permitido en primer lugar felicitar y expresar nuestra gratitud al Parlamento y pueblo suizo, así como a la Unión Interparlamentaria, por la excelente organización de esta 148 Asamblea. El Parlamento de Guinea Ecuatorial lamenta y se muestra muy preocupado por las diversas crisis que está conociendo hoy la humanidad como consecuencia de la polarización política, los discursos de odio, las guerras cibernéticas, los enfrentamientos geopolíticos entre potencias, el cambio climático, la contaminación ambiental, los conflictos armados, etc., las cuales impiden el normal desarrollo y evolución de la humanidad, sobre todo eh, los que afectan la paz y seguridad internacional. Por ello, consideramos que se debe encontrar una solución institucional e internacional utilizando la diplomacia parlamentaria. Actualmente, la diplomacia parlamentaria se ha consolidado como una nueva herramienta en la actividad parlamentaria. Tanto es así que hoy en día permite a los parlamentos hacer uso de ella, entre otras cosas, para tender puentes en orden a promover la paz y el entendimiento tanto a nivel nacional como internacional. Por ello, el Parlamento de la República de Guinea Ecuatorial, fiel a la política exterior trazada por su excelencia Obeanguemán Baso, a presidente de la República, jefe de Estado y de Gobierno, para el reforzamiento de la cooperación internacional con países amigos y las organizaciones internacionales y con el fin de promover la paz y el entendimiento entre pa países, considera que la diplomacia parlamentaria podría ser más útil fomentando, entre otras cosas, las siguientes acciones. Una, el respeto de los derechos humanos y la creación de sociedades más inclusivas. Dos, la cooperación con comunidades y líderes religiosos. Tres, la implicación y empoderamiento a la mujer y a los jóvenes. Cuatro alianzas entre parlamentarios, las organizaciones interparlamentarias. Cinco, la participación de los parlamentarios en los procesos de desarme de las Naciones Unidas, formando parte de las delegaciones nacionales o parlamentarias. En ese sentido, eh, es en este sentido, perdón, que las buenas prácticas que ha desarrollado el Parlamento de Guinea Ecuatorial en el ejercicio de la diplomacia parlamentaria han consistido en la formación de los grupos de amistad con varios parlamentos del mundo para tender puentes y el intercambio de experiencia, formar parte de las estructuras interparlamentarias regionales e internacionales como la Unión Interparlamentaria, UIP, el Parlamento Panafricano, la Unión Parlamentaria Africana, el Parlamento de la Comunidad Económica y Monetaria de África Central, CEMAC, la Asamblea Parlamentaria Pariteria, Paritaria, ACPUE, el Parlamento de la Comunidad de Países de la Lengua Portuguesa, APCPLP, y las Redes de Mujeres Parlamentarias. Cabe resaltar que el Parlamento de Guinea Ecuatorial, valiéndose de la diplomacia parlamentaria, ha intensificado en la última legislatura a acordar y organizar visitas de alto nivel en varios parlamentos del mundo que han terminado firmando sendos memorandos de entendimiento con el propósito de tender puentes con los demás parlamentos para promover la paz y el entendimiento. Concluimos. 
nuestra intervención deseando éxitos a nuestras deliberaciones. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And I would now like to invite Andorra, please. And then followed by Mali. Madame la Présidente, Mesdames et Messieurs les Parlementaires, cette dernière année a malheureusement été marquée par de nombreux conflits armés. Cette multitude d'affrontements actifs se déroule dans un monde multipolaire, hétérogène et divisé, qui continue de subir de graves catastrophes naturelles qui risquent de provoquer des vagues de réfugiés climatiques. En étant cette période d'instabilité mondiale où l'usage de la force semble généralisé et impuni, où le droit international est gravement érodé, il est plus que jamais nécessaire de soutenir la proposition de la UIP consistant à consacrer cette année 2024 à la paix et la sécurité internationale et en particulier de mettre si bien les actions que nous parlementaires nous pouvons entreprendre afin de contribuer. Parce qu'en tant que représentants du peuple, nous avons le devoir et la responsabilité de jouer un rôle moteur à l'intérieur et à l'extérieur de nos territoires. À l'intérieur de nos frontières, en tant que politiciens, nous devons nous ne devons pas peindre de vue que tous les moyens ne sont pas bons pour remporter des élections ou obtenir de l'influence. La lutte contre la polarisation politique et les discours d'un doivent être à toutes en force et en combat de tous et pour tous. Nous partageons l'importance cruciale des gouvernements nationaux d'investir dans leur société, notamment en offrant des opportunités équitables à toute la population par la biais du système éducatif, en tout en favorisant la coexistence et la cohésion sociale pour prévenir les extrémismes séparateurs et exclusifs. Cependant, nous sommes également conscients que l'éducation à elle seule ne suffit pas à résoudre cette problématique. À titre illustratif, la désinformation politique et la propagation de fausses nouvelles sont souvent créées dans un dessin politique bien défini. Ce n'est pas la faute de nos concitoyens. Ce n'est pas un problème d'éducation. D'autant plus que l'intelligence artificielle est un moyen utilisé pour promouvoir des discours opportunistes visant à influencer l'opinion publique dans une direction spécifique. C'est pourquoi il est indispensable de partager de bonnes pratiques pour contrer la polarisation et réguler l'intelligence artificielle. Au-delà de nos frontières, les parlementaires, nous avons également en responsabilité et le rôle de la diplomatie parlementaire et un vaste champ d'action que nous avons que nous avons. Aucun de nos pays n'est à l'abri des événements mondiaux et dans le contexte actuel. C'est important de collaborer et d'être ouvert au dialogue. La OIP nous offre un espace de rencontre, de connaissances mutuelles et de réseautage, parce que nous devons continuer de poursuivre le dialogue malgré nos divergences, car nous devons croire en la diplomatie parlementaire un type de diplomatie qui peut compléter et donc renforcer la diplomatie, la diplomatie gouvernementale. Un type de diplomatie où les parlementaires peuvent travailler sans précipitation pour résoudre des différents et de personnaliser les conflits. Nous avons pour mission de travailler à l'amélioration de la vie de nos concitoyens, de contribuer à nos communautés et en fin de compte de participer à faire un monde meilleur. Faisons un travail d'autoévaluation constructif mais critique, réfléchi mais pratique, pour identifier ce que nous pourrions faire pour promouvoir la paix et la sécurité. Identifions les obstacles et fixons-nous des objectifs concrets 
qui nous rapprocheront un peu plus de ces objectifs prioritaires et urgents. Parce qu'il n'y a pas de progrès sans volonté réelle et des actions concrètes. Sans avancer, les risques de mer graves et réels. Merci de votre attention. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite the representative of Andorra, uh, sorry, Mali, followed by San Marino. Thank you. Madame la Présidente de l'Union Interparlementaire, Bravo et félicitations pour votre intervention, pour votre élection brillante. Mesdames et Messieurs les participants, en vos qualités, rang, grade et tout protocole observé, bonjour. Permettez-moi, au nom des plus hautes autorités de la transition du Mali, Son Excellence le colonel Assimi Goïta, président de la transition, chef de l'État, et l'honorable colonel Maliki Djaou, président du Conseil national de transition, que je représente à cette Assemblée parlementaire mondiale, de rendre grâce à Allah, le tout-puissant miséricordieux qui nous a permis de voir cette session. Mesdames, la Présidente et chers invités, la présente Assemblée se tient dans un contexte de forte tension sécuritaire et géopolitique à cet effet. Les parlementaires ont vocation de jouer un rôle crucial dans la consolidation de la paix et la prévention des conflits. La paix est une condition préalable pour le développement. Mesdames et Messieurs, le thème du débat général de cette Assemblée intitulée « Diplomatie parlementaire » tisser les liens pour promouvoir la paix et la compréhension est assez évocateur. Ce thème témoigne notre engagement commun à participer au renforcement de la paix et de la sécurité internationale par les actions pacifiques. Nous devons œuvrer à réaliser l'aspiration des peuples à vivre dans la paix et la sécurité. Mon pays, le Mali, a connu des affres de groupes armés terroristes de connivence et en complicité avec les séparatistes pendant plus d'une décennie. Dans la partie septentrionale du pays, les terroristes ont occupé la ville de Kidal, et ce, malgré la présence des forces internationales, Barkhane, Serval, Minisma, lesquelles ont empêché l'armée malienne à accéder à une partie de notre territoire Kidal. Il a fallu demander le départ sans délai de ces forces étrangères pour permettre à notre pays de pouvoir recouvrer la pleine souveraineté sur l'ensemble du territoire. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers participants, la création de l'Alliance des États du Sahel AES entre Burkina, Mali, Niger répond à la nécessité de solidarité pour lutter contre le terrorisme et pour le développement économique, social et culturel de la région. Cette Assemblée se doit d'être une nouvelle opportunité pour booster la diplomatie parlementaire et retrouver toute sa place dans, en tant qu'instrument pour la paix et la sécurité internationale. Les citoyens du monde entendent des résultats car... Chaque assemblée coûte cher au budget de nos États en conflit et pour cette raison, nous espérons que cette 148e assemblée sortira des résolutions qui conforteront la diplomatie parlementaire dans le but de prévenir les conflits violents et faire avancer la paix parlementaire dans le but de prévenir tout ça. Et avant de terminer, j'exhorte les États riches à financer les projets de développement dans les zones en conflit et entreprendre des actions qui protègent les droits et le bien-être des populations vulnérables. Je vous remercie. 
Thank you very much. Uh, the next is uh, San Marino, followed by Chad. Madam President, Madam Secretary, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in these last uh, troubled years, the Parliament of the Republic of San Marino has distinguished itself in its wide commitment and contribution to maintain international peace and security. This has been realized with accurate, concrete and unanimous political acts that were aimed at providing solutions to the existing conflicts which still ruin a peaceful international coexistence. Our Parliament expressed resolutely not only on the current armed conflicts, such as in Ukraine and Israel and Palestine territories, but also on the political conflicts that have been neglected by many, but which are instead still very serious, as the case of the tragic and illogical division undergone by the small state within the European Union, Cyprus. Our delegates, whatever party they represent, are always acting in every international context to support a global dialogue. This is shown also throughout a constant participation to the electoral observation mission that are aimed at guaranteeing fundamental democratic procedures in every state. Our Parliament has always unanimously confirmed both all financial contribution to international organizations and to other peacekeeping mission. The Parliament of San Marino has always promptly ratified all the treaty signed by the government, including the Arms Trade Treaty signed in New York on 2nd April 2013, Unanimous, unanimously supporting the sacredness of uh, respecting international commitments. These are clearly fundamental good practice that uh, our Parliament has developed in the exercise of this diplomatic function, regardless of its pro-temporary composition. In addition to these efforts towards to the foreign affairs, with our commitment at an international level, there are other actions carried out internationally involving San Marino society. In this regard, it is sufficient to remember that our parliament supports a strategic concept where possible to repudiate the use of the force for the resolution of disputes, including state disputes. By virtue of this concept, San Marino is on its way to becoming the first state in the world without prisons. By eliminating the prison system in favor of more profitable alternative mazes, we are indicating an innovative and foresighted path. In other words, we choose a process of re-education of the convincing person rather than use detention, obviously with full and absolute guarantees for the crime victim. This is consistent with our Republican history. In this regard, I wish you to remember that the Republic of San Marino is the first state to have abolished the death penalty in 1865. Our parliament is therefore at the forefront in concretely supporting the affirmation for restorative justice as an alternative method for an open and inclusive pro, uh, protective society, the liberal democratic one in which we believe. This principle in an essential basis, certainly not the only one, to prevent and face any social polarization. In, it is uh, with such concrete commitment that the Parliament of San Marino fulfills its government responsibility, supporting peace and security between states in addiction to democracy and freedom within our state. It is the shared and prevalent belief in our parliament that these are the necessary, although not sufficient, condition to promote a peaceful coexistence both in national and international society. Again, ladies and gentlemen, our commitment can perhaps be summed up in a simple idea by Ortega y Gasset. Civilization is nothing other than the attempt to reduce force to ultima ratio. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is uh, Chad and then uh, Burundi, please.
Madame la Présidente, chers collègues, c'est un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole devant cette auguste Assemblée pour partager avec vous l'expérience du Conseil national de transition de la République du Tchad, de la pratique de la diplomatie parlementaire en vue de tisser des liens pour promouvoir la paix et la compréhension. Cependant, avant tout propos, permettez-moi de m'acquitter d'un devoir, celui de vous transmettre les excuses du président du Conseil national de transition, Dr. Haroun Kabadi, qui voulait personnellement prendre part à ses assises, mais pour des contraintes d'agenda interne, n'a pas pu faire le déplacement de Genève. Il m'a toutefois chargé de vous adresser ses salutations les meilleures et ses vœux de plein succès de cette Assemblée. Madame la Présidente, il convient de rappeler que la thématique que nous abordons aujourd'hui vise à atteindre et éveiller l'humanisme en commun en travaillant activement pour arrêter ou empêcher le comportement destructeur à travers la diplomatie parlementaire, étant donné que nous, les parlementaires, nous représentons les populations. En effet, avec l'essor des réseaux sociaux, la polarisation dans nos sociétés devient de plus en plus accrue. Ce phénomène pose un défi au Parlement car il a un effet corrosif sur la cohésion sociale et la sécurité. Œuvrer pour la réduire apparaît comme une approche préventive pertinente afin d'éviter qu'elle dégénère en actes de violence. À ce titre, le Conseil national de transition du Tchad fait de la paix et la cohésion sociale l'épicentre du processus de la transition en cours dans notre pays. L'action politique fondée sur la cohésion sociale vise à fédérer les inégalités vers les intérêts et les idéaux communs, tout en acceptant l'existence des diversités et des disparités sociales. C'est en cela que la politique de cohésion sociale a un rôle de pacification sociale. Autrement dit, la cohésion sociale est orientée vers un objectif collectif dont le but est de contribuer à l'équilibre et au bon fonctionnement de la société. À, à travers cela, permettez-moi que je partage avec vous comment le Tchad a utilisé la diplomatie parlementaire pour maintenir aujourd'hui la stabilité dans son, euh, au pays parce que après la mort brusque du président en exercice, le problème, le Tchad est entré dans le régime de transition. Et il a utilisé trois piliers pour mener sa diplomatie parlementaire. Il a utilisé le président du Conseil de transition lui-même, il a utilisé des organisations parlementaires et il a utilisé les groupes d'amitié. S'agissant du président du Conseil, après ce décès, euh, il a appelé en audience tous les ambassadeurs accrédités en République du Tchad pour échanger avec eux sur plusieurs sujets, notamment leur perception de la transition, leur position, la position de leur pays par rapport à cette transition et l'engagement de chaque pays à accompagner la transition pour le retour à l'ordre constitutionnel. En outre, le président a participé personnellement à plusieurs conférences pour expliquer la position de la République du Tchad en ce qui concerne la transition actuelle dans le pays. Euh, avec euh, toutes ces actions, le Tchad demeure aujourd'hui un État stable en menant sa transition et nous sommes aujourd'hui d'ici 
le 6 mai, il y aura les élections présidentielles pour le retour définitif à l'ordre constitutionnel. Mais permettez-moi de vous signaler tout simplement que sur tout un autre plan, il y a les conflits armés au Soudan voisins à amener un lot de réfugiés en République du Tchad. Et partout, on n'en parle pas. Alors qu'aujourd'hui, la situation du Soudan a impacté dangereusement la République du Tchad. Mais pour cela, nous, je, je profite pour féliciter les partenaires qui nous ont accompagnés pour pouvoir euh, contenir ce flux de réfugiés dans l'attente de résolution de ce problème. Et c'est sur cette note d'invitation que tous les pays s'organisent pour nous accompagner que je finis mon propos. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would now like to invite the representative of Burundi to take the floor. And uh, the next will be Russian Federation. Uh, merci, Madame la Présidente. Distinguée déléguée, Mesdames, Messieurs, avant tout propos, permettez-moi de remercier le Président de l'Union interparlementaire pour la parole qui m'est accordée. Je me joins aux illustres orateurs qui m'ont précédé pour contribuer au présent débat général qui, sans aucun doute, va consolider davantage les voies qui permettent à la diplomatie parlementaire d'œuvrer au service de la paix et de la compréhension des situations vécues par nos parlements et par les peuples que nous représentons. En effet, la promotion de la paix fait partie des responsabilités de représentation des citoyens. Les parlements sont ainsi des institutions légitimes pour prévenir les conflits, car ils offrent les meilleurs cadres d'expression et d'écoute de toutes les opinions. L'effort produit en faveur de la paix au niveau national doit être étendu au niveau régional et mondial afin d'assurer une cohabitation pacifique des peuples. Au Burundi, le Parlement organise fréquemment des descentes sur terrain pour sensibiliser les citoyens sur les valeurs de tolérance et de cohésion sociale, notamment au cours des travaux de développement communautaire. Les rencontres entre élus et électeurs constituent des occasions idéales pour recueillir les doléances afin d'attirer l'attention du gouvernement sur des situations susceptibles de créer des tensions. Le Parlement du Burundi est également très ouvert à la création des liens d'amitié et de coopération avec les autres parlements à travers les groupes d'amitié, les visites de travail et de courtoisie, la conclusion d'accords de coopération, l'impact dans les activités d'organisation, l'implication dans les activités d'organisation interparlementaire et le soutien des actes d'autres parlements lorsque nous sommes sollicités à cet effet. Tous ces efforts visent la réalisation d'un double objectif. Premièrement, il s'agit d'attirer l'attention des autres parlements et par conséquent des autres peuples sur les réalités qui sous-tendent le système politique et la gouvernance économique, ainsi que la culture et l'histoire du Burundi. Deuxièmement, cela nous permet de comprendre ce qui est vécu par les peuples frères afin de briser les préjugés et l'incompréhension qui peuvent mener à la méfiance entre les nations. En définitive, la diplomatie parlementaire constitue pour le Burundi une ouverture par laquelle il peut recevoir le soutien des pays amis et des partenaires 
et accorder le sien en cas de besoin. À titre illustratif, l'Union interparlementaire a soutenu le Burundi durant la période post-électorale de 2015, qui a été caractérisée par des tensions politiques, au moment où certains pays et certaines organisations internationales ne misaient pas cher à la paix dans notre pays. L'Union interparlementaire, en collaboration avec le Forum des parlements des pays membres de la Conférence internationale sur la région des Grands Lacs, leur a prouvé le contraire en dédramatisant la situation qui prévalait au Burundi à cette époque. Par réciprocité, notre Parlement soutient les autres peuples lors des processus électoraux en envoyant notamment des missions d'observation là où elles sont les bienvenues. Vive la diplomatie parlementaire et la solidarité entre les peuples. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to invite Mr. Kosachev, the Russian Federation, followed by the Netherlands. <clears throat> Dear Madam Chairpersons, uh, colleagues, uh, yesterday morning our plenary started with a minute of silence commemorating those who passed away or were killed in terror attacks. Among them are victims of a terrible terror attack right now in Moscow region with at least 137 people dead and this number will definitely increase. We are very grateful for all delegations which approached us expressing words of condolences. We asked the Secretariat to issue some official statement with the reaction of the IPU on that terror act. Unfortunately, it was not possible due to uh, rules of procedure. And this is how we decided that we would create a written declaration condemning this terror attack and reaffirming the crucial need for all states and nations to combat by all possible means uh, against terrorism. We have collected dozens of signatures, thanks for all who did it, and we invite all other delegations who did not do it yet to join this written declaration. Now back to the topic of our discussion. Exactly 25 years ago, on the 24th of March 1999, a war started in Europe. Some European countries, some NATO countries, attacked a European country. NATO countries bombed, at that moment, Yugoslavia, and Madam Chairperson may confirm that it happened exactly 25 years ago. At that moment, many people believed it was just an unlucky accident. No other way to interfere but to start this military operation. This is how NATO countries tried to explain this illegal operation. Okay. Nobody reacted properly. And four years later, NATO countries attacked another country, another state, Iraq, under very false grounds. And it started to become dangerous because we understood that one, NATO continued to exist, though all possible agreements about the future security in Europe. Two, NATO is going to enlarge. And three, NATO will try to dominate, preserving a right to attack any country which NATO dislikes. And this is why, four years later, after Iraq, President Putin in Munich, in a security conference, said the following words. We all have reached that decisive moment when we must seriously think about the architecture of global security. And we must proceed by searching for a reasonable balance between the interests of all participants in all international dialogue. Zero reaction 
from the West. And then another attack against Libya. And then invitation to Georgia and Ukraine to join NATO with, with, with all the following consequences. During all these years, NATO ignored Russia's fundamental security interests, interests of other countries in the world, and as a result, we are now in this crucial situation. Of course, it disturbed Russia because many things started to happen in Russian close neighborhood. And this is mostly about Ukraine. We tried to support Minsk agreements in eight years while Kyiv was continuing to bomb its own citizens. It collapsed for the simple reason Russia was the only part in these agreements trying to preserve them. At the end of 2029, we proposed security arrangements to the NATO countries. It was totally ignored, and the same happened in March 2022, when certain NATO countries literally prohibited Ukraine to start negotiating peace with Russia. Despite all that, Russia is ready to build bridges for the sake of peace and mutual understanding. We are committed to the spirit of Geneva, the city where conflicts ended and the most important international conventions were developed. But what is important? It is so important to pay attention to the protection of the principle of the supremacy of international law. No rule-based order should be relevant because no rules exist. And each and every country which uses this word combination has to confirm that there are no rules, but each time this group of countries decides what is right and what is wrong. And which people has this, the right for self-determination, like people of Kosovo, for example, and which people does not have this right, like the people of Crimea. My dear friends, we are very much concerned about what is happening in terms of security in Europe. And believe me, Russia is, de is definitely not the problem. Russia is definitely not the reason why we all are so much concerned about our theoretically common arrangements in terms of security. And Russia will not let anybody wait as soon as this group of countries will start talking, not fighting, not starting new wars in Europe or elsewhere thank, in the thank world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would now like to invite the representative of Netherlands to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I am honored to stand here before you, particularly to talk about such a pressing issue and talking about building bridges. It's evident that we are facing numerous of challenges on a global scale. The ongoing conflicts worldwide serve as a reminder to the fragility of peace and stability in our world. However, these armed conflicts are just one facet of the crisis we are confronting. We are also grappling with the looming threat of climate change, which jeopardizes the lives and homes of countless individuals every day. Additionally, economic instability has also cast a shadow. Moreover, the rise of anti-institutional extremism is a great threat to the credibility of governments worldwide, undermining trust at times when it needed the most. As parliamentarians, we have a solemn responsibility to uphold the values of peace, justice, and trust. The Hague, our political capital, is renowned internationally as a city of peace and justice, hosting many organizations dedicated to promoting these ideals. From the International Court of Justice to the par Permanent Court of Arbitration, thousands of experts in international law and governance converge here to share their expertise and work towards a more just world. Peace is not merely the absence of armed conflicts. 
It includes security, the rule of law, and the conditions necessary for individuals, for individuals, for families and communities to thrive. It is necessary to stand up for the most vulnerable among us and to combat discrimination and hatred in all its forms. Yet, even as I, as we strive to uphold these principles, we are comforted with a troubling reality within our own country, the threat of AI intelligence. It has recently come to light that on an explicit website, images of well-known Dutch women, including parliamentarians, are being abused in deep fake videos creating using AI technology. These deep fakes represent a terrible form of manipulation and violation, perpetuating harmful stereotype and undermining the in integrity of our society. As parliamentarians, we cannot allow women, children, also men to be victimized by the abuse of AI technology. The Dutch government is taking steps to fight this issue, with regulation and sexual offenses being approved in the Senate to combat this. Of course, this is not only a Dutch problem, but a global problem. However, legislative action only is not enough. We must come together as a community to denounce these actions and support the victims and stop harassment. Furthermore, I call upon the international community to join us in condemning the misuse of AI intelligence to manipulate and undermine women, children, and also men. Together, we must enact global measures to prevent and punish such abuses and find for the rights and dignity for all individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite uh, Sweden and then uh, we finish with Estonia for today. The representative of Sweden, please take the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it's late, but we are near to close this uh, day uh, of the session in EPU. I appreciate this opportunity to meet, especially in these troubled times when we are facing several challenging issues at the same time, be it climate change, poverty, food insecurity, war, conflicts, uh, but also terror. I believe that uh, the exchange of uh, ideas, thoughts and experiences is vital. I believe that listening to others and trying to see the world as they perceive it is crucial uh, if we are to succeed in resolving conflicts and reaching reconciliation. Furthermore, this is it in itself a central feature of a democratic society, freedom of expression and the right to speak, as we are doing here. Both of these are morally connected with the responsibility to listen. This is the essence of democracy, listening to others, uh, other people's arguments and trying to see things from their point of view, showing tolerance and respect for one another. At the time of the last Interparliamentary Union Assembly in October 23, the Middle East entered into a new war following Hamas' brutal attack against civilians in Israel. The attack went on, the attack has followed by severe measures. As a reminder of the importance that all combatants abide by the rules of law of war, also known as international humanitarian law, when the rule of war are not followed, it is civilians who suffer, especially children and women. And we stand with civilian suffering, starving, families, hostages. It's all about human rights for all. Meanwhile, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine continues. It is a blatant violation of international law and the European security order. Russia's heinous acts are an attack on democracy, 
on human rights and on international law, a war of aggression. It is my firm belief that the best way in which we as parliamentarians can promote peace and international security is to stand up for democracy, human rights, and a rules-based world order. Democracy is a prerequisite for lasting global peace and security. Many of the tensions and conflicts we can see in the world today, within countries and between countries, originate from a lack of democracy, a lack of respect for freedom of speech, for minority rights, for rule of law, and for other fundamental features of a democratic society. And that goes also uh, for the globally agreed rules, like not changing borders by military force. A rule-based world order also means following the law of the sea. It is therefore vital that, for example, the current attacks on cargo ships in the Red Sea cease immediately. I think it is important to take note of the fact that from around 1980, we witnessed a positive trend with more and more states moving from authoritarian to democratic rule. However, for the last 15 years, that positive trend has been re reversed and a larger proportion of citizens on this planet are now living in authoritarian countries. The decline of democracy is clear, but it is also slow and anything but um, ambiguous. At the same time that, that democracy and human rights are weakening in many countries, there are plenty of examples of countries where development is going in the opposite direction. This shows that there is still time to turn the tide and that it can be done. Democracy is uh, retreating in most regions of the world, with Latin America as the bright uh, exception. Well, uh, we live in times of dramatic change, times when different value systems and interests are colliding, times when the present can seem incomprehensible and the future feels uncertain. It is in times like this we need tools to prevent, manage, and resolve conflicts. And the United Nations and assemblies like this is, of course, meeting points for all of us to find a way to solve those conflicts. And I do hope uh, that uh, we together promote peace and security by developing our countries along a path built on cornerstones of democracy. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. And the last speaker for today is Estonia. Thank you. Distinguished Chair, dear colleagues, honorable host. A few days ago, I was in Athens, in Greece, where democracy was born thousands of years ago. Women political leaders around the globe gathered in Athens to discuss issues related to democracy in the 21st of century. It would be good to have the same atmosphere here in IPU as well. Also coming from very different backgrounds, having different pro political views, and very wide range of problems in our countries, we had a lot of common to discuss. It was not only the matter of uh, women representation. We discussed about IA, social media, role of political parties in democracy, conflicts, and so on. We all understood that the most important task for politicians is the obligation to look to the future and set the path so that life of those we represent, our voters and citizens of our countries, would be better. I believe that that obligation applies to all of us here and to other parliamentarians as well. No nation or country is happy if others around it are not. It is impossible to live happily on the expense of others, at least not very long. You will remain alone if you are seeing only enemies around yourself and think that you are the only who is always right. However, it is possible to learn from others and work together to solve complex problems and big crises. 
sharing experiences, explaining our pasts and burdens, finding understanding can be done more easily in the frame that only parliamentarians can provide. Be it in a session of a parliamentary assembly, visit of parliamentary friendship group to our respective country. Once you have broken bread somebody, it becomes increasingly harder to say no to them. Yes, sometimes it is hard to get even to that point. At first thing to reach is to put away prejudices and start listening to each other. It is very hard if there had been bad and painful memories, as emotions may include the clear thinking and hence the ultimate cloud of prosperity and peace. The Interparliamentary Union provides an excellent platform for further prospering parliamentary diplomacy. With over 160 member states and associate members, the IPU gives us a unique opportunity to deepen contacts between all regions of the world. Here we can collaborate with parliamentarians from other countries, address shared diplomatic challenges and promote cooperation. We can build bridges to fill gaps between governments and citizens and strengthen international relations. Building diplomatic relationships based on mutual respect and cooperation can pave the way for lasting peace. I would like to conclude borrowing words of English poet, priest and member of the parliament, John Donne. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. We tend to forget this simple and worn of truth until facing a serious challenge and rediscovering the need to cooperate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes our uh, today's debate uh, and we resume tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning and I would like to give uh, and send a special thanks to all of the interpreters on uh, everyone's behalf. They've really done fantastic work. Thank you very much, everyone.